the Chief of Staff to reiterate that message to uh, ministers. It has contributed in a significant uptick uh, in the access that we get um, in terms of information from PROs across the ministries, departments, and uh, agencies. And we also, when we engage with them, get the feedback that the old culture where a lot of PROs have been reduced to protocol officers in ministries going to airport and coming back is now toning down and they are having room. Ministers also had an issue with sometimes the qualifications and the professionalism. It's partly why we have enrolled all our PROs into the IPR uh, so that they can also step up their game in that regard. Now, as, as a country, we're trying to evolve and inculcate in our citizens certain core values. And let's say the values of mer developing a meritocratic society uh, that deals with the question of protocols, you know, people feeling they must cheat in exams and all sorts of things. So developing a meritocratic society. In what ways have you in the past four years developing communication strategies try to uh, nurture uh, such values in, in our society? Because we tend to just think that information ministry is so that we can come and defend government you know, positions and etc. But how are you able using the institutions and facilities there to inculcate the values of meritocracy and etc. that are core to our uh, national values? Chairman, all we've done in that regard is to deepen our collaboration with the National Commission for Civic Education. We recognize that in the communication space there's noise and there's perception. And as you rightly said, you've been uh, in the ministry before, so you know, as you've rightly said, sometimes people um, have a perception of who is bringing a particular message. But we found that the NCCE is a very good vehicle uh, for doing those things which, because of sometimes the political nature of our work, even our best efforts may not be received by some segments of the population. And so you will notice that our uh, collaboration, as in the collaboration between the ministry and the NCC has improved. The NCC, as you notice, for example, in COVID times, um, has, as a result, been able to show up and get out there on the ground. We're just about to do a second wave with the vaccination rollout program where we are working hand in glove with the NCC. Uh, but it's because we recognize that it is easier for people to receive some messages from them than from us who may look politically, uh, may I say, colored. And so that collaboration is what we are using to deliver on that. Last question, Mr. Chairman. In the last four years, during your tenure as information minister, the perception is that the media has come under enormous attack. Many radio stations were shut down because of issues about uh, licensing and, and other obligations that are reported not to have been met. What did you do? How did you fend off what was perceived to be an attack on the media and, and the perception that it was an attack on media perceived not to be politically friendly towards your, the government that you belong to? Chairman, thank you. Um, Chairman, yes, it came to my attention during the period that there was a perception that there is an attack on um, media uh, and on persons who practice journalism in this country. Chairman, if I may just uh, have some liberty just to expand a bit before I specifically answer this question. Whenever you hear of a report or whenever I hear of a report that um, a journalist has been attacked. In my mind, one of three things is most likely happening. First, it may be true. And there are instances in which it is true that this person has been attacked in his line of work of journalism. Then there are instances where it is false. It's a totally cooked up story. And then there are instances where it is a coincidence. Somebody may have been attacked. That person happens to be a journalist, but it has absolutely nothing to do with his work as a journalist. So, for example, Chairman, if you recall, 
uh, I think in 2006, if my memory is right, my colleague, Efia Pukuya, uh, and a couple of others, and this is a matter of public record, they went to the courts, the human rights courts um, ruled on it, went to NHI uh, to cover a story, and they were attacked by uh, people because of the work they were doing. So that is a clear instance where it has happened. Then you can have instances where, again, if I take you back to about 2007, you recall the case of um, the Palava newspaper, Mr. Jojo Busquansa, subject of a, a court ruling and the matters that came and the story that he had been abducted, found with blood, etc. Later, the police wanted to charge him for deceit of a public officer. It turned out that that was not true, but it had been reported that a journalist was under attack. So that is an instance in which the report comes, but it's false. And then you can have coincidence. For example, Samo Pabna Ini, Ashanti Regional DJ, I think president uh, at the time, between February and April 2007, shot in a bar. And initially the report was a journalist has been killed, suspected I was in his line of work. I think by April, the police had arrested the persons and it was because of armed robbery and proceeded to uh, uh, charge them and uh, get a conviction accordingly. So anytime you hear or I hear of an attack on journalists, my, my, my professional understanding is that one of three things must be happening. So what did we do? We realized that one of the first things that needs to happen is to have the reports of attacks on journalists validated. Because as the reports go and nobody is investigating and validating, you would notice that over the years, our ranking on the World Press Freedom Index is coming down because all this chatter is picked online and it counts against us. So one of the first things we need to do is to validate. Another thing we need to do is to ensure that there's proper follow-up on whatever investigations are supposed to take place. And then we also need to provide the media with a lot of support and training on how they can also protect themselves or ensure they don't get into instances where they become the victims of attacks. Because journalism the world over, uh, in fact, if you read the World Press Freedom Reports now, they argue that this is one of the most difficult decades for journalism. So what we did here in Ghana is that we introduced what we call the Coordinated Mechanism for the Safety of Journalists. It was my initiative, brought the Ghana Journalist Association, Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association, National Media Commission together. We explored the framework, went to cabinet, got approval, saved that the approval said it should be given to the National Media Commission to implement. And the ministry has provided National Media Commission with some resources that they are in the process of implementing this coordinated mechanism so that when a journalist says I've been attacked, they can do a proper investigation and validate whether it's one of the false stories or it's a coincidence or it's actually true. They can also help us do the proper follow-up. For example, in the case of um, Ahmed Swali, very terrible incident that I'm sure breaks all our hearts. We regularly follow up from the Interior Ministry. The minister designate was here. You heard the answer that he gave to the committee, the same answer that he gives to us. But we're hoping that a body like this can also continuously be doing the follow-up so that it is not my word or the minister's word, but they can also uh, be doing that. And then also to provide the necessary, as I mentioned, kind of training and support for journalists. And Chairman Wallace, well, let me just mention that for all of those who believe in supporting um, the safety of journalists. It's not enough to talk about it. I think we should also support the NMC with resources so that they can deliver on this coordinated mechanism effectively uh, for our common good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, yes, that was the part yeah. of the question. The second leg of it was media houses being shut down. What did you do? How did you help them out? Well, if um, we did. the first thing I sought to do was to get an understanding of what was transpiring. The brief I got, and indeed the, the, the documentation that uh, was given to me, uh, showed that there were a number of media houses that had had their authorizations expired and were fined by the National Communication Authority for the expired authorizations. And they argued that the National Communication Authority did not have the power to fine them. And therefore, they um, sued at the Electronic Communications Tribunal. The suit was at their instance. And the panel, uh, Professor Dateba, Dr. Nina Kukweno, and a third whose name um, immediately escapes me, found that, yes, the National Communication Authority did not have the power to find because
because the authorization had expired. And to the extent that the authorization had expired, they could no longer hold on to those frequencies, and the NCA could not purport to find them and still give to them an authorization which had expired. And the brief I got was that to that extent, the NCA then um, required of them to relinquish those frequency authorizations. But, Chairman, it's important to clarify that um, media in this country is not required to license before it operates, except that those who want to operate an electronic spectrum must get spectrum authorization. So what was withdrawn was a spectrum authorization of these media houses. As it turns out, some of them are still operating today, albeit on other platforms that don't require uh, 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 spectrum authorization. And we continue to encourage that they should reapply, and the NCA um, will be obliged as they go through their processes uh, to, where appropriate, where available, provide them with the necessary spectrum authorization for their work. Are you aware of any of them who has really applied and then they have allowed them to have their spectrum authorization? Are you aware of any of them? I, no, I don't have a brief to that effect. I don't have a brief to that effect. Yeah. Perfect. I'm grateful, Honorable Chair, and congratulations, Honorable Minister Nomni. In the past two years during your tenure as the Minister for Information, what could you inform this committee as to be your highlight and what were the major challenges and how you overcame them and how they prepared you to be more effective even in your, in your next mandate when given the nod? Chairman, thank you. The work of the Ministry of uh, Information is in about two major parts. There's the development communications part, which is working with the various ministries, departments, and agencies uh, on how to get a message out and get feedback to um, government. And then there is the part that deals with the agencies and then the department of the ministry. I think for me, my major highlight, one of my points of pride, beyond what we've done with the RTI implementation, um, would be in totality what we've done with the information services department, specifically the research department of the information service. Uh, at the time I assumed office, you had a research department that in a year will produce about 300 um, public reaction reports. You get a report that says one farmer in Pukurantumi says that this, and one teacher here says that, that. And we thought that wasn't scientific enough. So what we did was to work uh, with some collaborating agencies to build a world-class research unit from the information service department, 260 districts across the country, provide them with um, the necessary tablets and software so that when you issue a questionnaire at the click of a button, it can be administered in 260 districts to provide central government with information that uh, it can use for decision making. Specifically on RTI, if I may just have some liberties, Chairman, to speak to RTI briefly. Um, the law assented to in 2019 took effect 2020. A number of things we've done. First, we've created the RTI division at the Information Ministry. We have trained and deployed RTI officers to ministries, departments, and agencies across the country, as well as MMDAs, and then independent constitutional bodies. We had a roadmap that required 26 different activities to execute for the implementation of RTI. Chairman, I'm happy to inform your committee that currently about 18 of those activities have been completed, five are ongoing, three uh, are not due to be executed yet. Uh, in terms of training and work, so for example, ministries, departments, and agencies, out of 526 officers that we need to train, we've trained 455 who are on the job today responding to RTI requests that are coming in. Um, across the districts, out of 552 that we are supposed to train, we trained 483, and they are working today. And today, for example, at the end of 2020, the RTI units across government had received 56 requests. 56 requests uh, had uh, responded to all of them, uh, granting access to um, 44 of them, 
about two of them were transferred, four of them were referred, one application was withdrawn, one was denied and is now um, uh, on application for review. So between ISD research and then RTI division, uh, those will be some of the highlights um, in my tenure so far. I'm grateful, Mr. Chairman. Um, on page five of the CV of the nominee, and if I may refer the nominee to page five of your CV, the first paragraph talks about research and publications, and there are two publications indicated here, one to do with corporate communication in banks and the other to do with exploring the budget deficit, economic growth, and, and, and new evidence from Ghana. How relevant, as having indicated in your CV for this purpose, I suppose these findings hold some relevance to the portfolio you've been nominated to. What were the findings of these publications, the key ones, and how relevant are they to your nomination? Well, um, Chairman, thank you. I think the first is um, my dissertation for my uh, Master's in Business Administration. So we studied corporate communications in banks in Ghana, a number of banks, and studied the major challenges they were having. And one of the major challenges was the fact that often you will find a bank or an institution advertise something to the public, but internally, that internal communication to get everybody on board hadn't taken place. And so you go to a branch trying to access the product or service, and um, somebody at the branch who is supposed to know and administer it doesn't know. I find that it happens even in central government as well. So the lessons we drew from there, we are able uh, in the development communications model we are trying to use by requiring internally a clear explanation of whatever it is that some ministry, department, or agency seeks to do, so that everybody in the government system at least has a good understanding and therefore is able to explain it. Have we been 100% successful? I don't think so. But it's work in progress that we can um, continue to improve on. Chairman, the next publication uh, deals with the economic growth nexus between deficit and growth. Um, I may not go in, into too much detail, but essentially we were studying the relationship between deficits and growth, and the finding essentially was that contrary to the thinking that high spending brings high growth, if the high spending is leading to high deficits, then the subsequent years, the lag effect is such that there's rather contraction. And so the neoclassical idea that high spending will bring uh, high growth, we were able to provide evidence from Ghana between 2000 and 2015 uh, using data from the finance ministry that that's, that does not apply. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That'll be all for now. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, in 2017, the Chief Justice set a special TV license court in all the 10 regions then to enforce that law on licensing of TVs. What is the status of that arrangement? Chairman, my understanding, the last time I interacted with the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, is that that uh, had not yielded much effect. The reason, if I recall, is that the board was contemplating other options for generating revenue uh, for GBC. And it was around that same time that the then Director General uh, my understanding is without full recourse to the board, wrote to the CJ to designate some courts. So the internal mechanism you need to push and pursue that was not necessarily forthcoming from within their own institution. But Chairman, I think we have a slightly different view of how funding that should go to GBC should take place. Under the DTT policy, we are looking at the Digital Access Fund and how monies from that fund, part of monies from that fund can be ceded to the public service broadcaster to make public service broadcasting more efficient. Because the arguments about who should pay TV license uh, and who should not pay in contemporary times, uh, I'm, I'm informed does not find favor with uh, a good number of stakeholders in the industry. So our view when we do get to that point will be to focus more on the Digital Access Fund, and I'm, uh, I've been working, when I was Minister for Information, 
I was working with the then Minister of Communications on that project. My hope is that if you do pass me, we'll get back on it and move it forward. Eric, hold it. Chairman, just one. Did I hear you say public service broadcaster? Is GBC a public service broadcaster or a state broadcaster within the meaning of the law establishing it? Well, Chairman, within the meaning of the law establishing it, state broadcaster. Indeed, it fits into my earlier point about state-owned media. Well, you just said state, uh, you just said public broadcaster. So that leads to it. Should we expect you as minister to take appropriate steps to revise the legislation governing the operations of GBC to situate it as a public broadcaster? Yes, Chairman, absolutely. And I did make a representation to the National Media Commission, which is responsible for GBC uh, so to do. In effect, the National Media Commission set up a GBC reorganization committee to do that because we can't directly do that as a government. But the committee never really got to work before the tenure of the um, Abu Fadr administration one came to an end. My expectation would be that, yes, if I do get in office to pursue that, get the NMC properly structured to put in place the review committee, and one of the products of the committee would be to revise the legislation to achieve what you are talking about, the public service broadcasting. Uh, Chairman, just a comment so that Honorable Eric continues. You know, GBC are state broadcaster. Where they are, no one else is in terms of provision of service and information. Where they are, other radio, TV stations are, don't find those areas attractive. So they suffer a crisis of identity. And you have a situation where other competitors are saying that why are they taking uh, TV license and justified? But they don't respond to the other concern that they are not where they are. So it's just for you to take note that they have served their country well. We have not helped them in terms of reforms. And you can use BBC as a model public broadcaster to guide what your future decisions may be. Thank you, Chair. Um, before you proceed, I think this issue relating to TV license, which uh, resulted in the GBC directorate seeking to set up, is an attempt to enforce an existing law. You're saying that the law does not find favor with some stakeholders. What is your plan for that particular law? Chairman, as part of the reorganization, the views that we will be submitting to the committee, because as I reiterate, we cannot just go in there and begin to turn GBC around because of the nature of the creature it is. So we will submit our views to the reorganization committee. The view is that we discontinue the TV broadcasting agenda and move to the digital access fund and then also change the legislation and make GBC a proper public service broadcaster. As we are here, GBC is the one that is providing feed for all the private stations to uh, carry. And like Lida said, they have paid their dues to the country. But through the public service broadcaster mode, we can also ensure that we properly fund their operations. Yes, please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, as part of your functions as the Minister of Information, you are responsible to offer information to the Ghanaian populace on the activities, the policies of the government. You recall the 2019 State of the Nation Address, the President touted as an achievement the establishment of an air wing of the police service. He actually stated that the country was going to take delivery of three helicopters to help make the service robust in the fight against crime. He further announced that some police officers were already undergoing training to become pilots. Additionally, in the 2020 budget, precisely on page 202, government highlighted some of the monumental achievements made over the period. And one of the achievements was that government had purchased three helicopters 
for the police service. Where are these helicopters? Chema, thank you. Um, Chema, my uncle is right when he says that as information minister, I'm responsible for uh, providing information. There are many times when I will speak for the state, there are times when I will speak for the government, there are times when I will speak for the administration. But in all of these, I work based on a brief I have received. Unfortunately, Chairman, as I said before you, I don't have an updated brief on that matter. I could find an updated committee uh, in due course, but I don't have an updated brief on that matter. Updated brief on the whereabouts of the helicopters. On the subject of the air wing okay. of the Ghana Police Service and their logistics. Okay. Honorable nominee, you recall that in the large budget, there was an allocation of 6 million Ghana cities for communication. You recall during the debate, it was an issue. Can you indicate to this committee what went into the utilization of that allocation? Chairman, first of all, may I make the point that the uh, annual budget performance report will come and provide some more detail, but I can provide some highlights here. That 6 million CDs was not part of the goods and service budget of the Ministry of Information. It was an allocation for communicating government flagship programs. Government had 16 flagship programs, from planting for food and jobs, um, to NAPCO, to all of the uh, other flagship programs that the Akufo administration um, had. Free senior high school and everything that came along with it. Our job at the ministry was to design programs uh, and activities through which the responsible ministries could express or to update the country. And we did quite a number of them. We had a number of nation building updates, town hall meetings, mass media campaigns on television, etc., that allowed these various ministries handling the flagship programs to tell their story. Indeed, Chairman, as my uncle will recall, getting to the 20 20 election, there was this joke in town that uh, everything you say, the MP people say free SHS. That was evidence that the story was being told and being told uh, uh, pretty well. So, as I mentioned, the annual budget performance report can provide the specific details, but these are just a few highlights, Chairman. Very well. Yeah, General Brian Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations, nominee. Um, my first thing is, in 2021, what is the relevance of the information ministry in this modern day governance? Take it into consideration what the ministry's mission is and core function. Mission to provide media relations and facilitate the adequate and timely and reliable information to the public for socioeconomic empowerment and enhance democratic citizenship. Is this not a function that can be played by a press secretary sitting in the office of the president looking at what is happening in other countries in modern day governance? Is the Ministry of Information relevant? I think cognizant of what Harry Nigris has said, that you are providing gas in areas where commercial radio stations will not go. But that said, do you think that the modern day governance ministry of information is relevant? Chairman, we're running a democracy. One of the key things that makes democracy survive and do well is the free flow of information and the availability of information so that the people can make an informed decision. The government collects taxes from people, road tolls, takes people's money, borrows in the name of the people, and purports to execute all manner of activities for and on behalf of the people. The government must have an opportunity to regularly update the people on what it is doing, take feedback from the people, and use him to augment what it is doing from time to time. Indeed, Chairman, if you look at the sustainable development goals currently that have been put out, the SDGs, goal 16, goal 17, require a strong 
information delivery machinery for any government to be able to achieve those objectives of a peaceful, inclusive society for fundamental development, etc. In the case of Goal 17, strengthen the means of implementation and revitalization of global partnerships for development. Chairman, that is a job that is very distinct from the job of a press secretary at the office of the president. In our context and where our democracy is today, you will require a press secretary at the office of the president who is on a regular basis um, providing the kind of information on what the presidency or the president is up to. But across the ministries, departments, and agencies, for all that is going on, you need a bigger machinery that is churning out the information and taking feedback and using same to inform government. So today, the ministry and its departments more relevant now than ever. Take COVID, for example. And when it became necessary to get boots on ground to the marketplaces and to the lorry stations to educate people, with the greatest of respect, the press secretary at the office of the president may not have the machinery and the um, attention even to do those. But that is what we specialize in. So, yes, we are relevant. Thank you. Honorable, the Ministry of Communications and its agency the NCE has authorized 575 radio line services. 428 are in operation, 147 not yet on air. 33 of these radio stations are state-owned, state-owned public radio stations across the country. 33 of the 428 in 428 radio stations. The state has 33. Do you think in this day and age, the state should be in competition with the private sector in radio. The statistics is saying for uh, TV, you have 65 TV stations in operation across the country, and the state is still competing with the private sector. Don't you think that the time is now for the state to move away and let the private sector operate in that space? You can still uh, send your word across through the private sector media. Thank you. Chairman, thank you. The private sector is driven primarily by commercial motives, primarily. But beyond commercial motives, there are many other tasks in the governance area, in the information dissemination area, that must be undertaken, but which may not bring any commercial benefit to a private sector player. Things even including the preservation of culture, language, heritage. It is important for government, or the state rather, the state, to be in the media space, and it happens the world over, to provide, among other things, public service broadcasting. So that where the private sector will not go because there's no commercial motive, they can augment that space. I'll give you an example. When we opened the new radio station in Yindi, I don't have the names of the languages readily off head, but languages that are not spoken on any of the local stations in that catchment area are being spoken on this station, and it's helping us to reach the last mile of the Ghanaian populace with messages which, if we had left it just to the commercial players alone, they may not be able to get there. So, um, I don't think state-owned media should take over the entire place, but there's a specific place for public service broadcasting, Voice of America, PBS, the BBC. Um, in China, they have state-owned um, um, uh, media. That ensures that some part of public service broadcasting gets across, because it's one of the rights of our citizens. Uh, General Honor Brian, if you allow me a follow-up to build on a very relevant observation you made. Fortunately for us, the Minister for Communication is also here sitting and uh, listening as a member of this committee. What the Honorable Brian have referred to, TV, radio stations, licensed by the NCA as a regulator, content, content, regulated by the National Media Commission. There is a tough war. And the third war, you are aware of it, is between the NCA and the National Media Commission. 
which has not allowed for proper control and regulation of the sector. Now, will you work with your colleague to seek to resolve these administrative differences? I presume that an answer to it will be a broadcaster bill, I presume. And I should say that I left the Ministry of Communication in 2012. I referred to the Ministry of Information then, a joint cabinet memorandum between the Minister for Communication and Information to give meaning to this legislation. So just related to his question and give us some assurances what you do. Chairman, so two things. I work um, very closely with the Minister responsible for communications, as she then was, and uh, with your grace, um, will become, hopefully. And given the opportunity, we will do the same. Um, secondly, we inherited a broadcasting bill, and we have done a lot of extensive work on the broadcasting bill in terms of consulting various stakeholder groups. And by your grace, if I am passed, I expect to bring it to this honorable house in this eighth parliament. Some of the new things we've had to try to attend to in the broadcasting bill is a question of fake news, which learning from other parts of the world, we've been able to draft a provision for, and hopefully when it does get here, we'll have an opportunity to engage. So still keep it there. You use fake news. How can you regulate social media? In fact, that is why I said another before leader came in. Another area that this, um, may I say, amended draft seeks to deal with is the digital space. Chairman, if I may just share some data with your committee. The Afrobarometer reports um, recently published show that at least about a third from 2014-2017, about a third of Ghanaians are consuming news from digital platforms. Unlike newspapers where under the legislative instrument you are required to register at the NMC, and therefore, even if you publish something that was out of 10, you can appear before an NMC and you can be called to order. In the digital space, currently, all you do is you register your domain name, pay your www dot something, and then you are on it. It's even um, uh, expanded with social media, which are not um, websites properly so called, but people have pages on websites. And there's absolutely no regulation or guidance there. So some of the things that we are proposing in this amended broadcasting bill will be to address some of these concerns. And I think leadership is very right in that area. I will pray that when we do bring it to the House, we get um, the support from the entire House to tweak and to adjust what is necessary so that we don't end up infringing on free speech and free expression because some countries in their bid to solve that problem have gone that way. And we have a piece of legislation that can work for all of us. Brian, let me still have some of your bread. Minister, if you have your constitution there, refer to Article 1623 of the constitution. And media is used there in a generic sense. And it reads with chairman's indulgence, I quote, there shall be no impediments in the establishment of private press or media, or media. And in particular, there shall be no law no law, on my emphasis again, requiring any person to obtain a license as a prerequisite to the establishment or operation of a newspaper, journal, or other media for mass communication or information. Are your hands not tied? Absolutely not, Chairman. Chairman, if you look at how the uh, National Media Commission has circumvented or has um, work with Parliament to make provisions for this. The legislative instrument only requires you to register with the NMC when you want to publish a newspaper or some sort of publication. You are not required to get a license. Indeed, it applies to all other media houses, and that's why I was making the distinction with the Honorable Mahama Yaga's question, that for the electronic media even, the license is only for the spectrum that you are utilizing. So our hands are not tied. We have room to do legislation that will ensure that the freedoms and liberties are not infringed upon, but the risks that the society is facing are also contained.
Thank you. Romini, you have largely changed the face of government information in this country. If it is coming from you, it's reliable, you can be trusted as giving us the true facts. Um, these are facts. Um, your background in economics, marketing, law, if approved by this house, what different things are you going to do for government, for information? <laughs> what different things are you going to do with your rich background and the fact that now you change the face of government information, you are trusted and you can be relied upon? Thank you. Chairman, I think I'm going to walk into a very controversial area um, with this question. So I'll take law, for example. And as leader drew my attention to, if you read Article 162 of the Constitution, the concept of media freedom, and you compare it to the generally thought understanding of media freedom, a good deal of people believe that media freedom essentially means that uh, the media is free to say and do anything without any inhibitions or without consequences. But that cannot be the case. In fact, if you read the ruling of Lord Denon, um, it clearly ex explains that media freedom is only the ability to publish without any prior embargoes or fetters. It doesn't mean there are no consequences after you've published. It doesn't also mean that anything at all can be published. So if it's 622, it says subject to, subject to this constitution, and any other law which is not in consent with this constitution, there shall be no censorship in Ghana. That means that there can be censorship which is constitutional and censorship which is born out of a law that is not in consent with this constitution. And let me take you to Article 164. The provision of Articles 162 and 163 of the constitution. Chairman, Chairman I'm sorry, I have to come. No, no, he just used a word. Censorship which is constitutional. Is that what you meant? Yes, Chairman, that's what I said. Censorship which is constitutional. Yes. Thank you. So the Constitution says subject to this Constitution. That's why I said I'm going to walk into a controversial terrain. So there can be censorship which is constitutional. If the Constitution proscribes expression on some matters, this Constitution, it will not be unconstitutional. And if there's a law that is not in controversial of this Constitution and it proscribes advocacy or um, uh, publication of some material, that will not be unconstitutional. Now, I want to bring you to 164. The provisions of Article 162 and 163 in this Constitution are subject to laws that are reasonably required in the interest of a national security, public order, public morality, and for the purpose of protecting reputations. What it means, in my humble opinion, is that laws can be passed in the interest of public morality, public order, national security, that limit, in fact, if you read the side note, it talks about limitations on rights and freedoms. So I'll give you a current example. Today, there appears to be advocacy starting for LGBT activities in this country. The um, Attorney General designate when he came here made the argument that um, customary law is accepted by the Ghanaian Constitution. Customary law frowns on LGBT activities. Now, people say, despite the um, criminal code and the general provisions of um, customary law, it's just free expression. They are just advocating for it. But if you ask me about law and background, I'll say that that is where somebody like me will argue that then we should be able to contemplate legislation in the interest of public morality, which will not be against the Constitution, but will now say that you cannot advocate for and promote LGBT activities in this country. Mr. the question was, you have a rich background in economics, marketing, law, and today you have largely changed the face of government information. You can be trusted. You are seen as honest. What new things are you going to do if approved by this House? Well, the big, the big thing that we want to do in this um, second term, God willing, if we have your grace to uh, be approved, is to complete the retooling of the Information Services Department. At the last cabinet meeting um, of the Akufo administration in the last ten hours, we got approval in principle to go into the uh, provision of communication funds for the ISD across the country and to assist retool them. I believe that it will make a major difference 
especially in these extraordinary times, in getting message to ground. And in the second term, it will be one of the major things that I will be um, focused on doing for the department. Another thing that I believe um, I would like to do in this second term is to um, help grow a lot more spokespersons um, for various sectors who are skilled in the various areas and can speak authoritatively or provide um, information authoritatively. So that the citizen gets served with quality information, information you can trust, but from people who are also experts um, in this area. Talking about spokespersons, there is this phenomenon now, communicators for political groupings, and they are practically taking over the broadcast space. There's not a single matter in discussion that broadcasters will not call one person from this party, one person from the other party, irrespective of the knowledge base of the persons they're inviting as spokespersons. Also, what the public is treated to is the total misrepresentation of the facts, the laws, and the expertise. Do you have any inclination to do something about this kind of phenomenon? Chairman, it is the way of our politics and our media operations in Ghana today. I'm really not sure that we'll be able to walk back the, the hands of time on that one. What I think we can do is, as I suggested earlier, to invest more in um, getting people equipped in specific subject areas so that when there are discussions on those subjects, then these persons are well skilled and able to be the ones who lead the public engagement exercise uh, in that way. We can also, by moral suasion, encourage media owners to invest in their media talent, to build their capacities and competencies in specialized areas with which they can also lead their discussions so that we all don't become generalists speaking about everything, but we can have um, more experts leading and participating in discussions on specific areas. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, um, we'll do it. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Nomni. Mr. Nomni, I would like to take you back just briefly to a question Eric Opoku asked about DBC. And I think I heard you, I don't know if I heard you right, say that um, when he asked about TV license and where DBC was with that project, you gave your answer and alluded that the former Director General try to implement it without recourse to the board. I'm sure you are aware that before the former Director General was dismissed from his position, the NNC, which is, was a supervisory institution, instituted uh, an investigation into the circumstances under which the TV courts were so-called here. Yeah. And did you see a copy of the report? as Minister of Information. No, Chairman, I was Deputy Minister for Information at the time, and that was not my brief. You had actually become Minister of Information before the former Director General was dismissed in September 2018. Chairman, I became Minister responsible for Information in November 2019. 2019, okay, that's right. So when you say that he it was without recourse to the board. Are we taking it that you are saying it authoritatively, that this was the outcome of the investigation, or you are going by what was thrown out there, the narrative that was thrown out there when the TV license uh, came up? No, Chairman, in the brief I got from my predecessor minister, the Honorable Mustafa Abdullah that was the information that was passed on to me. That's why in my earlier answer I said that the brief as was made available to me, said so. Thank you. Uh, my question is, as the main government information focal person, would you be able to provide this committee some clarity on the matter of frontier health care solutions? 
some ministers' designates have been here, about four of them, and none of them is able to tell this committee how we came about with Frontiers Healthcare Limited. But I want to find out whether as the minister responsible for information, maybe you'll be privy to how we came by that and whether we couldn't have used that opportunity to even give a local company the opportunity in order to build their capacity or to empower them, knowing that Frontier Health Care uh, is a Nigerian company, and whether we couldn't also use Noguchi to do the test at the airport. Chairman, thank you. Um, Chairman, I'm a member of the Presidential Task Force on um, the COVID-19 response program. COVID-19 response was escalated from the Ministry of Health to the Presidential Task Force level. The Presidential Task Force is the one that um, tasked the Ghana Airport Company Limited to explore options by which it could find an acceptable instant testing mechanism at the airport, which will allow the airport to be reopened. The Ghana Airport Company Limited then proceeded, according to the brief I have, then proceeded uh, so to do and reported back to the presidential task force that they had been able to come up with an option and that that option will allow people to be tested, I think, within 15 minutes at the airport. Um, and then the airport could be reopened. Chairman, I have observed your committee's hearing. I have seen a question put to, I think, other ministers. Respectfully, if I may um, uh, suggest, Chairman, I think that the most appropriate person would be the Minister for Transport, under who the, or the Minister for Aviation, assuming there was one, but now Transport, under who the Ghana Airport Company Limited operates. It is his agency who will be best seized to provide um, all the details on that matter. Thank you. My other question has to do with uh, judgment debts. Yeah, in the last few weeks, we've read in the media a couple of issues about judgment debts uh, that have bedeviled this country. In the previous government, the architecture was that we had a senior minister, we had finance minister, we had ministers of state. We had almost everybody in there to play advisory roles. What would you say gave rise to this huge level of judgment debts that we are experiencing? Uh, Chairman, um, I think we have all read in the media uh, that there are some judgment debts. Um, it is my expectation that we will be seized with the details and the proper documentation so that we can actually establish whether it's true or not. Um, if there needs to be some investigation to find out, assuming it is true, how it was occasioned. It is after all of those that we can even take as a matter of fact that these are truths and therefore proceed to make some commentary or analysis alongside. My last question is on COVID. As Minister of Information, can you give us time, some timelines on when to expect the, your rollout plan, basically, for, for COVID, and also tying it in with the Center for Disease Control in the USA has put Ghana on the radar as a high-risk uh, country and actually advising its citizens not to travel to Ghana. How would you work to promote and project, sort of repair the image of Ghana because it really gives us a bad image, although I wouldn't say we have much control over COVID, but once your country is isolate, isolated and called a high-risk country, what can we do as an information ministry to try and repair this image? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, um, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, the government of Ghana will be formally announcing the vaccination rollout program with all of its details. I will crave your indulgence that I do not go ahead of that formal government announcement in terms of timelines, et cetera, as the honorable member um, requested. The second part of the question deals with how will we repair Ghana's international image. I think that already on the global platform, Ghana is very highly applauded for how as a country 
we have managed the COVID situation so far. We've all seen various publications on international platforms uh, and acknowledgement by WHO, etc., of Ghana's efforts. COVID is a global challenge. Uh, so even if today you are doing well, you can't take it for granted that it means you will forever be uh, uh, part of the top tier. So I think the answer lies in our substantive success, that we have to succeed collectively in the COVID program. Once we do that, like it was in the initial stages, the world itself would know that um, uh, Ghana is one of the examples to look to. So, and if you observe today, a number of things that Ghana started doing months ago, many countries are now beginning to follow suit. And so I believe that the answer lies in the substantive success of our response program, and the world itself will know. Very well. Honorable. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Honorable Nominee, and congratulations. Honorable Nominee, without prejudice to Chapter 12 of our Constitution, specifically Article 162 and 3, um, you would agree with me that in recent times, there have been publications of uh, issues against people or citizens of this country. And that's why I say without prejudice to Article 1623, which uh, allows the press or media freedom. But at the same time, with the permission of Chairman, I read, any medium for this dissemination of information to the public, which publishes a statement about a person, publishes a statement about a, against a person, shall be obliged to publish a rejoinder, if any, from the person in respect of whom the publication was made. Honorable Nomi, um, for some reason, it is becoming uh, I want to choose my words carefully. Um, if you like a practice where you listen to radio stations, you wake up in the morning and there are publications out there uh, without necessarily cross-checking as per the ethics of journalism, the facts of the matter. Now, uh, by the grace of God, when you are giving the nod, we know there's a media commission. How do you think that you can work with the media commission uh, effectively to ensure that uh, there is a balance in the reportage? As I said earlier, this is without prejudice to Article 162. Chairman, thank you. May I preface my comments by saying that um, the media has a very, very, very important role to play in our democracy. Indeed, the provision that you read, um, Article 162, Clause 5 and Clause 6, which enjoins the media to uphold the principles, provisions, and objectives of this Constitution and uphold the responsibility and accountability of the government to the people of Ghana is a provision that is critical in ensuring that sunlight is thrown on all the activities of government so that people who get into public office do the right thing and do it in the interest of the people of this country. Chairman, unfortunately, however, because on the other side, the media landscape has been totally liberalized, there are if I may land with the full sentence. Because it has been totally liberalized, unfortunately, there are people who have the opportunity to practice media without recourse to, for example, a background training, whether in media law or media ethics, or who are operating in a space that suffers what is described on the international platforms as um, the products of the difficult economy when it comes to media practice. 
The consequence is that you have people who are practicing media and the output is below par, like you have suggested. I don't think that the answer is in throwing away the baby with the bathwater. Media is so important, as we have read already, that I believe what we need to do is to provide support for training, capacity building, and improvement in the quality of standards, even where we find infringements. So for example, under the DTT policy, for television, for example, and under the Digital Access Fund that we are speaking about, there are efforts to ensure that we take away some of the costs that media on their own was bearing. At first, if you are setting up a TV station, you have to buy your own transmission equipment. Today, because of the DTT program, all you need is a studio to produce your content. You may not even need a studio. In fact, part of the DTT program is to set up studios so that content providers just uh, provide. So to lower the cost of entry. But more importantly, I believe we need to fund the training, the continuous training and support for journalists to build their capacity and eschew some of the things that um, you complain about, which will require rejoinder, etc. I never studied media during my formal education. But when I had the opportunity to practice, my employer spent a lot of money and time putting me through training. I want to believe it contributed to my work. And that is why I believe that across board we must provide training and support for media. What we have done at the ministry is to introduce what we call the Media Capacity Enhancement Program. Uh, there's a working group made up of people from um, the Ghana Journalists Association, Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association, National Media Commission, GIJ, with the support of UNESCO, and the ministry's funding, where they are putting together curriculum for people who are practicing and who need some touch up on their skill set. That is what we are doing on our part. I know what the communications ministry is doing, but as I've said earlier, for all of those who are interested in media, it's not enough to talk about it, but we must put our money in the kitty and support the training and development of you. That is the only way you are going to get media that lifts up to the standards that you are looking for, Chairman. Thank you, Vice Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, um, content management. Um, sometimes you're listening to radio stations. Some are even uh, adverts on TVs, and people, uh, if you like, marketing themselves to be able to double money and to do other things. They sell uh, drugs which ordinarily one would have thought that uh, they would have sorted the prior consent and approval from FDA and all the relevant uh, government agencies. And these, they are happening on the media front. Once again, not curtailing the, the rights of uh, the media. How well can you, with the National Media Commission, ensure content management, i.e. some of the things that I've mentioned, Chairman, thank you. And to make that happen, we need the broadcasting bill passed into law. As I mentioned, already some work has gone into it, uh, but it is critical that we pass the broadcasting bill because it will also, among other things, now allow the National Media Commission to reintroduce the uh, content authorization legislative instrument, LI 2224, which was shut down by the Supreme Court, which was very well intended aimed at sanitizing the industry uh, from some of the things that you and I don't want our children to be watching on television at certain times, but which, because of procedural matters, uh, was shut down. So as has been mentioned earlier, we intend to pass a broadcasting bill, uh, which should provide a broad legal framework upon which, for example, the legislative instrument like 2224 that was shut down can be brought to bear and begin to regulate some of these areas. I personally wrote to the Bank of Ghana protesting the activities of money doublers on television because in the absence of clear standards and legislation, you cannot even compel the stations not to put that on their network. The Bank of Ghana could use a route because they are more or less the custodians of our currency. So if they print currency and other people are also doubling currency, then they go out. And I think in the last 24 hours, they've, they have issued some directives to that effect. But the substantive answer 
lies in passing the broadcasting bill so that the airline and other things can come to light and sanitize the situation. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, finally, Chairman, uh, uh, Honor Henry, let me just come in. I'm getting some guidance from Chairman. When you referred to the LI, you were specific, which has been, in your words, knocked down by the Supreme Court. Yes, Why I said shut down. Shut down. And then you further were saying to bring it back to form. Within the meaning of the constitutional article, to the extent that any enactment is inconsistent with the constitution, the Supreme Court has the power that they exercise. Absolutely. So contextualize your statement. When you say bring it back to four, is it to disrespect the Supreme Absolutely Court? Absolutely not. When Absolutely. they are rightly exercised their mandate. And then also I'm happy the ministers for national, uh, those who work at national security brought it up. Just for you to be guided. The Honorable Brian raised it. Henry, Honorable Henry have raised it. Parameters, parameters. In Brian's context, public broadcaster, state broadcaster, commercial broadcaster, uh, community radio. And the respected Professor Karakari and even Audrey, Professor Audrey and Co. have written extensively on it. When will we have a legal framework which defines these parameters? Then we know, for instance, these are private players. We know, for instance, these are public. Then we know, for instance, this is a local Bimbila or a Yerubi as you come from their FM station. Thank you, Chair. Chairman, thank you. And Chairman, as I was mentioning earlier, that is what the broadcasting bill will help us do. Because even Chairman, the definition of broadcasting, the definition of broadcasting becomes a controversial matter, but the bill seeks to answer all of these questions. So as has been mentioned earlier, we'll be guided accordingly. Yes, I know what I need. You come to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Sorry, uh, sorry, uh, we are not uh, finished. Uh, oh, no, I can hold on. Hmm? I don't know, uh, Henry. Henry had not finished. When the leader uh, interjected. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, uh, finally, uh, your answer may, or your ministry may have to work with the communication ministry to provide solutions to this. Almost every person occupying positions of trust or sensitive position, for that matter, have had his or her name, for that matter, um, dragged in the mud. Reasons being that Facebook, people are creating Facebook accounts for politicians, for bankers, name them, and they are duping people, extorting money from them. Um, efforts have been made uh, through other means in contacting Facebook, the managers of Facebook. It hasn't worked. Now, can you assure this house that when you are giving the Lord, you will work with the communication ministry to see how best you can, as a country, deal with Facebook on such matters by ensuring that the, the privacy, not necessarily privacy, but the, the uh, people are protected because it is really getting out of hand. You open a Facebook account, they say verify. You verify, and there are 14, 15 accounts being created in your name. Every day, one or two are being closed, another one emerges. W what is it that we can do about this? So, two quick things. First is that the Ministry uh, of Communications has already rolled out a cybersecurity framework. I think an act has been passed by this house. There are a number of things therein that are aimed at ensuring that we have a tighter grip on the cyber um, challenges that we are having in this country. As I mentioned, I've been working with the minister. I look forward to working uh, with her so that they can see the light of day in this second tenor. Chairman, but on the other side as well, we need to also take some personal responsibility. If you go on social media, 
and you see an account that belongs or an account that purports to belong to somebody and the person starts asking you for money through momo numbers uh, i think some basic duty of care must also be encouraged on the average Ghanaian. And perhaps what we have to do is some more education in that area, even while we tighten the cyber security uh, provisions as have been spoken about. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the Ministry of Information exists to disseminate and inform the public about government policies and programs. One major department that helps you, the, I mean the ministry, to execute this mandate is the information service department. The minister is aware that the information services department does not exist in some districts, particularly newly created districts. And even in those districts that they exist, resources is a challenge sometimes to even get money to buy fuel so that you can go around to perform their duties is a problem what would you do to ensure that those districts that they don't exist you have i mean you open the department for them and those who have but resources is a challenge you are able to resolve it so that they can support you to perform your duties Chairman, thank you. As I mentioned earlier, uh, at the last cabinet meeting of the previous administration, we got approval in principle for uh, an ISD transformation program, as we call it at ISD. It includes provision of the information vans across all 260 districts, um, some logistic support to the district office. There are districts where it's difficult to find the basic logistics, as you mentioned. And then there are some places where there are no offices, so an adjoining district has to uh, serve them. As I mentioned, we got approval in principle. Our expectation is that in the 2021 budget uh, and the medium-term expenditure framework, it will be accommodated. My prayer will be that when it comes, I get the support and advocacy um, of uh, the House so that we will get the resources and make this a reality. Mr. Summer, in one of the middle press organized by the Honorable Nominee, he assured Ghanaians about the fact that government is stepping up messaging on COVID-19. And uh, if you move in Accra, you hear some adverts being played to educate the people. But when you move to the rural areas, it's totally absent. When you are in Bodhi district, Gabusho district, uh, Kontomra district, Bia East, Bia West, you will never hear one advert about COVID being played. What account for that and what are you going to do to ensure that those rural districts also benefit from uh, this information so that it will also guide them so that they don't, uh, I mean, they avoid uh, COVID-19. Chairman, the honorable member is absolutely right. Um, messaging went down for a while. We are picking it up. Uh, it started very strongly in, may I say, the capitals. Uh, the challenge we have now is um, boots on ground. We have um, submitted the Information Services Department's budget to the Ministry responsible for health. Uh, the minister assures me, or the president's representative, I beg your pardon, assures me, uh, that they are working to release some funding so that the vans can get back out there on the ground, uh, especially on this mask campaign that we are currently on. And hopefully the people of Bodhi uh, will see and hear uh, the vans out there. Well, that's, uh, lastly, uh, there is a rationale for organizing media press to educate the people on pressing uh, issues. And uh, I, I just want you to look at the timing of late of organizing the media press. You know that in this country from 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock, that is where uh, major TV stations and the radio stations organize their program. Of late to that is where, when you also organize the media press. And so 
people who have devoted attention, people who want to listen to the regular, I mean, media houses, will not even listen to you. Don't you think that you should uh, consider the time? Because 8.30 to 9, it's, 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 it's problematic for me. We want to look at the time of organizing the media press so that many Ghanaians can listen to whatever information you have for them. So I'll take my senior's advice accordingly. They didn't hear you. Oh, Chairman, I said I'll take my senior's advice accordingly. Yes, yeah, I don't know when it's up for communication before I come to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With the easy access to social media platforms, we've seen a proliferation of fake news, defamatory material, all published on, paper, on social media platforms, and people hiding behind the anonymity of social media to publish all kinds of things. What are you going to do to limit the scourge and extend the reach of regulation and oversight to those who act in that manner? Chairman, as I mentioned earlier, the digital space is fast growing. I have with me a copy of the Afro Barometer. Uh, dispatch number 250 of 6th November 2018. And a few highlights therein. For example, from 2014 to 2017, consumption of uh, daily news from digital sources in 2014 had grown up. In fact, prior to 2012, you couldn't account for consumption of uh, daily news media from digital sources. But from 2012, about 6%. Then 2014, 30%, 2017, 31%, and I'm showing the recent service gradually, uh, the market is tilting there. The traditional newspapers, etc., easier to regulate because they are registered and you, know, you can identify the people behind them, and therefore the levels of responsibility are comparatively higher. But on the digital platforms, it's easy for anonymous people using websites or social media platforms, etc. That is why we believe that the new broadcasting um, bill will help us to create um, a certain framework within which digital broadcasting and digital publication can also have some semblance of regulation around it. And as I've mentioned earlier, it's my hope that we get the support of colleagues when we do get to that point um, to implement it. Mr. Nomi, does freedom of expression mean an affected right to publish anything any, anywhere without limitation or boundary? And does the media have a duty to act responsibly in the discharge okay. of their obligations as the fourth estate? And if so, how are you going to ensure that they do? Freedom of expression um, freedom of speech as a subset of freedom of expression, freedom of media uh, is not absolute. As I have hinted earlier, even the Constitution which recognizes these doctrines makes them subject to constitutionality and other laws that are not inconsistent with the Constitution. Um, but interestingly, if you look at Chapter 12 of the Constitution, it ties in freedom with responsibility. If you look at the side notes, just close to Article 162, it says, freedom and responsibility of the media. So, I am a firm believer in media freedoms. I believe we all are. We should uphold it, promote it, safeguard it, but we should also at the same time be interested in supporting the media with the things that make it easier for them to also live up to the standards. Chairman, just a little one. If you can just paraphrase yourself, you believe in media freedom. 
You want to add independence to it or just freedom? Is it just that freedom? Freedom and independence, leader, right, thank you. of the media. And as I've mentioned, while we um, uphold it, we should also work to support um, the media so that they are also able to live up to um, the responsibility required of them. At the risk of sounding like I'm defending my media colleagues, Chairman, there are some of the infractions in the media space that are not out of malice. They are not out of malice. But because of the very liberalized market in which we are, uh, there are people operating who have not had even the benefit of any training or support. And that is why I argue that we should support them so that they can do that which they desire to do without falling into the tentacles of irresponsibility. Very well. Uh, yes, Honorable Nomini, in your response to a question earlier asked about the closure of some radio stations, you indicated that what happened was a revocation of the spectrum authorization and not license and not the licenses of those radio stations. I'd like to know from you whether you think there is any distinction between spectrum authorization and license really. Yes, Chairman, there is. If you look clearly at the constitutional provisions, it will be unconstitutional to purport to license any media house. The license that is spoken about refers to the authorization of the spectrum that those who desire to operate in electronic media must be given by the National Communication Authority. To that extent, I would say that there's a clear distinction between the concept of licensing media. For example, digital platforms don't require any spectrum, therefore they don't require any spectrum authorization. Print, same. Um, for those who want to go into electronic and desire to use spectrum, frequency, they are those who must go for the um, authorization of that spectrum because it's a finite resource so that we ensure that you are on 90.3 and I can be on 100.7. That is why you would require that um, authorization to be able to use that spectrum. And I think that the distinction is clear. Now, the minority media leader earlier cited Article 162 and sought to demonstrate that 162 Clause 3, where the provision says, or talks about press or media, like you, press or media. His understanding is that the use of the word media here is expansive enough to include the electronic media. And, and, and the understanding of the use of the word license here, license, license, should cover the spectrum authorization. You sought quick refuge under Article 164 to justify why there can be some limitations to um, the enjoyment of the freedoms uh, 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 granted under 162. Now, I happen to act for one radio station which was shut down, a community radio station, uh, namely Radio Mantambu which operated around the Bimila area. The reason cited by the NCA for the revocation of the authorization of Radio Mantambo was security concerns, that nebulous concept. Are you aware of any other reasons canvassed for the closure of Radio Gold, Radio XYZ, under the specific the specific exceptions 
provided for under 164, which includes interest of national security, public order, public morality, and for the purpose of protecting the reputations, rights, and freedoms of other persons. Chairman, as you have just read, Honorable Member, my understanding of the brief I received is that it sits under 164, specifically freedoms of other persons, rights and freedoms of other persons. Spectrum is finite. And so your allocation of a particular spot on it, 93.2, means that nobody else can use it. It means also, therefore, that some obligations are imposed on you so that you can continuously use it. If you renege on those obligations, and the Electronic Communications Tribunal is of the view that that amounts to giving up that spectrum, that, in my understanding, clearly fits under the question of the rights and freedoms of others to use that particular spectrum. Because if you want it, you fulfill the obligations associated with it. That is my understanding of the brief as I received it. Now, apart from that cluster, you are raising another station that you are mentioning was based on national security concerns. I unfortunately don't have a brief on that matter, so I am incapable of speaking to that. But to your specific question, my understanding of why spectrum authorization and the fulfillment of obligations associated with it is to ensure that the rights and freedoms of all other persons can be accommodated within that finite space. A follow-up question on that. Rights and freedoms of other persons, um, in, in effect, would mean that some other persons may have been granted the frequencies on which radio stations like XYZ Gold operated. Otherwise, how does the concept of rights of other persons arise here? Do you know of any specific persons who must have acquired those frequencies that Radio Gold and XYZ used to operate on no, prior chairman. to the revocation? No, Chairman, that is not the point I'm making. I think. Um, if we go back to the ruling of the Electronic Communications Tribunal, as by the Leonard Dateba, Dr. Nina Quino, etc., if my memory serves me right, they explain the concept of spectrum and why it is finite and why the dial you have must be protected for you so that nobody can interfere with it. And why, if it is being protected for you, it's a national resource which has been given to you to utilize and therefore you have some obligations to fulfill so that other persons can be stopped from interfering with it. And if you therefore elect not to comply with the fulfillment of those obligations, then the rights of other persons will kick in. It is not to say on a specific matter, I am aware that A or B or C is looking for a particular data. Indeed, if, if my memory serves me right, these frequencies that you are talking about have not been given to any third party, if my memory serves me right on that matter. Yeah, so there are no specifics I have in mind. Yeah, lastly, you also, in response to a question on media, still on media freedoms, um, you, you, you stated that uh, whenever it is, it is um, proper that we do some form of validation whenever media practitioners come under attack to satisfy ourselves that the attacks suffered by a media practitioners relates directly with the work they do. You, you, you made that proposition in, in response to uh, an earlier answer. I just want to find out from you as former information minister, did you become privy to any form of validation done in respect of the murder of Amir Shwale, that is number one, and two, Adeti, who practiced from uh, Bolgatanga, my regional capital, and three, 
Manasseh Azure, who had to flee this country because there were some threats on his life. Did you do any validation in respect of these three individuals? Chairman, so on the case of Ahmed Swali, it's a very interesting point that you raise because all of us today are operating with the assumption that the very unfortunate thing that happened to him was because of his work as an, an undercover journalist. I am operating under that assumption. I believe you are also operating under that assumption. The point I'm making is that because the police has not been successful in getting to the bottom of it, this is the assumption we operate under. There are instances, as I've cited in times past, where journalists have claimed attack, which has turned out to be untrue. There are instances where journalists have actually been attacked, but it did not have anything to do with their line of work as journalists. And I believe that, respectfully, I've cited examples here this afternoon. The reason for which it is important to validate is so that we can all come to a certain clear understanding of what the truth is and proceed from there to resolve the consequential matters. So in the case of Ahmed Swale, we are operating on that assumption. That is why every now and then, when I speak to um, my then colleague, the Interior Minister, I want to find out, have you gotten to the bottom of it? This is a matter that we should be able to deal with and find the perpetrators and bring them to book, like was done in the case of um, uh, Kwabna Ining in the Ashanti region. It helps us to punish those who are responsible, prevent such acts from happening another time, and to put the record in its proper context. Abeti, for example, I met with him. I may not say some of these things publicly until I'm asked here. I met, I, I, I invited him, his chief executive, Mr. Kwabna DC, uh, and himself, I met with him, spoke with him, I spoke to the regional police commander about whether or not safety mechanisms have been put in place for him to return uh, at that time, at the heat of the crisis, and what mechanisms were being made to ensure that uh, he was safe, even when he was here in Accra. I met with him here um, in Accra. Um, if you take um, my, my brother Manasseh, for example, it gets a bit controversial, because the information that's available to me at the time was that he reported that his life was in danger. The National Security Minister assisted for us to provide him with a police officer of his choosing to secure that. Later, the information I got was that he had left the country to take a break. He, to the best of my knowledge, never went on record to say he had gone into exile at the time. It was Professor Kwame Kakari of uh, who was formerly of the Media Foundation for West Africa, who in a public lecture then cited his travel and said that he had gone into exile because his life was in danger. Chairman, can I validate? Can you validate? I cannot. But I don't doubt him. I don't doubt him. The point I'm making is that we need to move the conversation from a point where it is he said, she said, and get to a point where a body that we all support can help us make progress in some of these conversations. Else, depending on where the shoe is, somebody will let somebody will deny. But if we are able to resource the NMC to execute this coordinated mechanism for the safety of journalists, we'll all be the better for it. Yeah, I promise I'll be, I'll come to you. Yeah. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable Kojo Okon Nkrumah, MP of Russia, congratulations. You are still 38 years old. And will you be the youngest Minister and Minister of Information? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Let's go to Chapter 12 again. Um, article 1624. It says, editors and publishers of newspapers and other institutions of the mass media shall not be subject to control or interference by government, nor shall they be penalized or harassed 
or their editorial opinions and views or the content of their publications. Now, we see government in there, you speak for government. Would you say that this constitutional mandate has been complied with by President Kufuado's government and is being complied with? And why do you think that some sessions of society uh, give out this perception that government is harassing the media? Well, I think that the Akufuado administration has complied with this constitutional provision um, and has been ensuring that we do not control or interfere with the work of editors and publishers, or that we do not penalize them or harass them for their editorial opinions and views or the content of their publications. Um, I think not only have we complied, but we have gone further to do other things that are aimed at enhancing access to information. I think earlier I spoke about the Right to Information Act, which was a bill that had come into this chamber for over 15 years, kept coming in and going. And on the watch of President Akufuado, that bill has been passed into law. And today I'm happy to report to your committee the number of RTI requests that have come based on the infrastructure we've put in place and have been responded to. So not only have we complied with this, but we have gone further to do things that are aimed at expanding the frontiers. But it is true that there are lots of reports of attacks on journalists. That is true. And by the way, all of those reports are not necessarily coming from or um, accusations at the doorstep of government. In fact, you recall that even in our recent elections, supporters of some parties that were not happy you know, with some media houses participated. There are private organizations. You know, there are people whose money locked up at institutions. They take their, you know, anger on the media. So various sectors of the Ghanaian community are indulging in this. And I think it contributes to the perception. But as I've said already, we need to put in place a mechanism that helps us to validate, that helps us to track, that helps us to sanction persons who are involved because we need to protect the media. The media, the fourth estate of the realm, provides the sunlight that helps our democracy grow. Thank you. Now, we've heard about uh, our colleagues talking about 164, um, which is very critical under the freedom and independence of the media. The media doesn't have a fettered um, rise in um, pursuing its uh, vocation, but there should be laws which are reasonably required in the interest of national security, public order, morality, uh, for protecting reputations, rights, and freedoms of other persons. Now, do you think there are adequate laws to back this provision? especially for public morality and protecting rights and freedoms and reputations of persons. And I will tie in this with the ally which was uh, declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court and what efforts have been made to ensure that it's cleaned up and brought back to this place. Indeed, I was a member of the, indeed I was the chairman of the Central Legislation Committee which passed this ally. And I happened to be a member of the media commission too at that time. But the Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional. But I was thinking that with all these years, about four years now, we do see that we've worked adequately enough on these aspects to be able to um, enforce what is law. Chairman, so the first part of my answer is that no, I don't think there are enough laws. There are still a lot of gray areas that need to be touched up, even including some of the ones you are mentioning about public morality. Um, secondly, the LI-2224, I believe, will be best grounded on a broadcasting act. Because in the absence of that broadcasting act, the LI, my view respectfully, is, 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 is hanging. And you can't put something on nothing. And that is why I've mentioned earlier that one of the things we seek to do after the consultations we did in the last four years, sending the draft bill back to the various stakeholders and getting their input, um, we couldn't meet the cabinet timelines, 
But what we are now poised to do is to be able to bring that broadcasting bill into this House, get the support of members, have it passed, and then proceed to do an ally which should hopefully then have uh, an enabling legislation beneath it that can stand the test of time. Because I think part of the ruling in that case, uh, the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association versus the Attorney General and National Media Commission, was that you could not, by legislative instrument, list out those sanctions that the NMC sought to put out for infractions. Any such sanctions will have to be contained in a proper um, bill, which becomes an act. That is assuming it is not unconstitutional in itself. And these are the parameters that will be working in, hopefully, if you approve me and I become minister. The last one is about politicians who own media houses. There are several media houses, especially radio stations, who, which have ended up being owned by politicians or pseudo politicians or people fronting for politicians. What really do you think are the challenges in this area? this matter is concerned. So, Chairman, I think um, it's, it's, it's a position between two extremes. The Constitution gives all these freedoms, which allows everybody who qualifies and who can afford it, including politicians, to set up and own and operate media organizations. And I do not disagree with that. But on the South side as well, there are standards that must be met, including content standards. I think the, the, the real fear is that some politicians go very extreme, especially when they own media. And to cure that, what you need is a legislative framework that proscribes some things. If you have that, it doesn't matter who owns the station. Because it is actually possible that a politician does not own the station, but can do very dangerous things on the station. So respectfully, it is for me not about whether the politician is in ownership or not. Though I agree it can give greater access and higher risk, but it is more importantly about setting the standards legally and the consequences thereof so that Politician or not, owner or not, we don't go there. Yes. Um, so, so. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Honorable Nomini, in recent times, there are concerns over attacks on journalists, which has been raised over and over again. Uh, you have been seen to be condemning irresponsible journalism. Uh, more than attacks on journalists. Would you say irresponsible journalism is the reason for these attacks? Chairman, even before your committee, I've mentioned that even where journalists have committed some infractions, I believe that for many of them, it is not out of malice. It's probably because they have not benefited from the kind of training and standard setting that you would expect. So where journalists are involved in what you will call irresponsible journalism, what you will call irresponsible journalism, even that is not an excuse to attack journalists or to harass journalists. It's not an excuse. There are legally provided avenues which give room for when you feel that you have been offended by the work of a journalist to employ. But violence, harassment of journalists is unacceptable and should not take place. So I consistently make this point, and that is why we even went further to put in place this coordinated mechanism for the safety of journalists, and at the same time, a media capacity enhancement program, so that we can help those who may incur some infractions, uh, but through no fault of theirs, but at the same time, provide a framework that can help us protect um, a journalist. So if that is your position, um, then I think you should be worried about the closure of uh, the radio stations uh, that have been um, 
brought before this committee over and over again, particularly Radio Gold and Radio XYZ. Uh, the reason being that you have consistently said that we need to support journalists, we need to support them, even in the face of infractions. In other words, we are given a purposive uh, approach of the possible interpretation the of the law. This house makes rules. And we say we should uh, support people who are breaching the rules. Please, let's move on to other things. No, uh, no, no, no. no. Uh, Mr. The Chairman, of no, my, Mr. Chairman my, we my make position, laws. Somebody has breached the law. No, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, my position is that the, the minister is saying that even in the face of what is seen as irresponsible journalism, there are some of them which are not out of malice. So my point is that, so the radio stations that were closed down, was their infractions out of malice? Yes. Um, Chairman, I think my very good brother is putting the authorization expiration question in the same basket with irresponsible journalism. I think that the two are different. Um, I think irresponsible journalism, which he spoke to, if I understand him, well, it's about a journalist who in the line of his duty is not complying with the guidelines or the ethics of the Ghana Journalism Association or of journalism. Those ethics, I came with a copy of them here. It's a, it's a whole list that every journalist is doing. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. Those are the ones that I think if you breach, we are talking about irresponsible journalism. And what I'm saying is that even where that happens, you don't have a right to attack or to harass the journalist. I think that is very different from a media house that has elected to go for spectrum authorization and has flouted the terms, has been fined by the NMC, has gone to court, and the court has ruled against him. I think that the two are very different. Then, um, as a quick follow-up to that, in a very recent matter that uh, got my attention, there was a similar case where a journalist made certain statements that were not in good taste. And what happened, this journalist was not only arrested and kept beyond 48 hours, at the time he was at released, at the point of release, he was served with a contempt application. And this contempt was saying contempt of the judiciary, which was even unknown to the law. So my point is that there are things happening in the system that accounts for the reasons why the latest freedom, I mean, data on press freedom is ranking Ghana the 30th. And what would you do as a Minister of Information about these matters so that Ghana can, you know, re regain its place in the, you know, I mean, uh, in the international spheres? Chairman, I think in my examples before your committee, I have cited specific names, for example, that I was aware of and how I, quote unquote, intervened in those situations. The incident that my good brother is talking about uh, has not been brought to my attention. I am unable to speak to it specifically. But even beyond that, Chairman, I believe that we need to have solutions that are not personal, but solutions that stand the test of time, institutional solutions. And that's why I've been speaking about the coordinated mechanism for the safety of journalists, the media capacity enhancement program. Because I believe that these are two vehicles that if we support some of these things, some of which may not have been directly brought to my attention, uh, can be arrested. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, here yeah, before. Yeah, the, um. Chairman, thank you. Um, Minister, um, is the Advertising Association of Ghana under your jurisdiction? No, Chairman. Oh, okay. Very well. But I want to posit a question in that area. They've been clamoring for the passage of the advertising bill, and they, they've been pushing for that for some time. They've been honoring lots of media personal, personalities, including uh, Bernard Avle and the last Gong Gong Awards, which I believe um, you participated in. They've been supportive of government efforts 
during this COVID time. Their executive secretary, Juan Francis Dazi, um, mentioned, I think a week ago, about the challenges that they are going to be facing during this after um, inception. And that that bill ought to be passed because if it's not passed, they wouldn't have a council to protect their businesses and that Nigeria has an advertising bill or act in place that protects, and a council in place that protects that space. You being the Minister for Information, God willing, are you going to help that association uh, push through that bill in the support of the Corporate Ministry, I believe in the Ministry of Trade, reading around it. Thank you. Chairman, sure, thank you. I've had the opportunity to read that bill and to even profess some views to the association on it. I believe that uh, the objective of the association is a very good one. Yes, you are right. In countries like Nigeria, they've made a lot of progress. Not only does it deal with issues of counsel, etc., but even advertising standards and um, other persons entering the marketplace and taking uh, market shares on duty from current operators. I think, however, in the last draft of the bill that they brought, um, on their own volition, if my memory serves me right, they withdrew to do some corrections, and they are yet to come back. And as and when they do come back, you have my assurances that I would support the minister responsible for trade to have it passed so that their subsector can also uh, be well regulated to be fruitful or more fruitful for them. Second question is on projecting election results by the media. I'm sure you've projected an election results in this country. I believe, I think in 2008 or 2012, you projected President Mills as the President elect, I'm sure, around that time. It's become a topical issue. Do you think it's going to help our democracy or it's going to hurt our democracy? Chairman, um, the Honorable Member is right. In 2008, or I think January 2009, when the third round of that election had been concluded, I participated in the projection of the election results at a Multimedia Group Limited to the effect that the candidate of the NDC, uh, Professor John Evans Atta Mills, God bless his soul, um, was going to be the winner of that election. Um, a projection is not a declaration. A projection is a statistical analysis based on all the votes that have come in and what is outstanding. And as democracies mature and media practice matures, it actually helps a democracy because as the results come in, in our case from 275 constituencies, and as the media, political science analysts, civil society groups are all before the full view of the country going through the numbers and doing the analysis and projecting, not declaring, projecting, they are in a place to now settle and conscientize the minds of the population about where this election is uh, most likely going to um, and I do not see anything wrong with it. I believe that it is um, part of the growth of the media and its protection that we are talking about here this afternoon. And all efforts that can be made to deepen and to strengthen our democracy and things associated with our elections, such as what you are talking about, should not be discouraged. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, I have a program here. Honorable yeah. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Chairman, let me um, begin by expressing my concern when the nominee, nominee suggested, because we are past broadcasters that our previous profession can be censored under the 1992 Constitution. But I think the remedy to what he suggests is in Article 1, Section 5, and Chapter 5 of the 1992 Constitution. And so media men 
perhaps should not be that worried that um, somebody may just censor uh, our work. Mr. Chairman, again, I have tried to uh, avoid questions since this uh, veteran started in relation to what happened to Radio Gold for very good reasons. Um, but in an answer to a question that was asked earlier, I do not know where my colleague gets his briefing from, but it will be instructive for him to keep an open mind and perhaps uh, get briefing from you know, all parties involved. I do know that uh, the station, uh, after a number of representations, uh, withdrew their challenge even in court. Yes, they challenge the fines. The court ruled in their favor. The authorities saw in the ruling an opportunity to shut it down. It did. It challenged that opportunity again in court. But due to some representations that were done, even including a parliamentary select committee, the station decided to withdraw the cases based on an understanding that had been reached with the ministry and followed through with requests that was made of the station to reapply for the authorization to use a spectrum. Those letters are yet to be responded to by the government. Mr. Chairman, in all of this, my question is I have seen the memorandum that accompanied the 2014 bill when it was worked on, but it never happened. And in it, as a result of the uh, quote, as a result of the count, as a result of this, the country does not have clear, transparent, and uniformly applied legal criteria for the grant of broadcasting authorizations. Now, I took it from this point because it's talking about the number of laws we have in the media that are not consolidated and that as a result of this the country does not have clear transparent and uniformly applied legal criteria for the grant of broadcasting authorities now this lends the process to arbitrariness and patronage all the same at the same time the regulatory overview of the content of programs is virtually non-existent i relate this also to a research report by freedom house international in which it says, in part, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, that in some parts of the world, the threats to press freedom are explicit and often violent, and that journalists are murdered or imprisoned. States maintain strict media monopolies, and domestic audiences are cut off from foreign news sources. Now, such unambiguously hostile conditions typically elicit strong responses from international advocacy groups and democracies that are committed to defending freedom of expression. However, in a much broader range of countries, governments are using the more subtle tools of media regulation to restrict press freedom, maintaining a veneer of legality and pluralism that is less likely to draw attention or criticism from abroad. Manipulation of the regulatory framework allows leaders to either tolerate or rein in influential news outlets depending on the political situation and permits even democratically elected governments to fortify themselves against future electoral competitions." Unquote. Now, being a former broadcaster yourself, how does it feel, given what we know, and given the fact that this contributed to Ghana dropping in the ranking when it comes to international, I mean, when it comes to freedom of expression. How do you feel as Minister of Information that all of this is happening under your watch, a former broadcaster, and what have you done to save the situation? Thank you. Indeed, that publication from Freedom House, which it refers to, um, aligns with my comment earlier, and I think I was first to even say that that which ought to be done, which is this broadcasting bill that needs to be looked at and passed, we have to be careful so that it does not become the guise under which we claw back 
on the rights to free expression. I think I mentioned it earlier. Because there is enough data that shows various jurisdictions where in an attempt to handle some of the excesses that is or are being complained about here, it has been a cover for these um, clawbacks in those jurisdictions. And I think the point that I was making earlier, which sits very well with the article you just read, which is a view that my brother, who is also a former broadcaster, I believe shares, is that we should be sure that even in trying to solve the problem, we don't create perhaps even a worse problem in this space. My feelings are expressed, I believe, in that route, that this is how we have to handle it. There's a challenge on our hands we have to deal with, but we have to be careful not to fall into this trap. Well, I hope we are not in the trap already. I think I'm suggesting to you that we are already in that trap, and perhaps we must be working together to come out of it. Now, um, as a chairman, in 2017, um, when this House worked, the seventh Parliament worked on the uh, budgetary allocations to ministries, the uh, Committee on Information, I think, and Communication, presented its report. The chairman, Kennedy Ajafon, complained at the time about how much the state was uh, owing the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. He did put the figure at around 40 million Ghana cities then. Um, in 2019, November 6, actually, there was also a meeting with the president. The NMC uh, complained, or if you like, pleaded with the president to help the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation to pay an electricity debt of about 25 million Ghana cities. I recall uh, going through the new supports that you were instructed to help uh, make that payment. I don't know if that payment has been done. But my question is, recently, um, we lost um, one of our former leaders, uh, the one I refer to as the man who ended the decade of decay and introduced democracy, God bless his soul, uh, Jerry John Rollins. And there was a state funeral that was uh, done. GBC have accumulated these debts over the years as a result of the service that they have been doing for the state on behalf of government. At this state funeral, the information is that the coverage of that funeral was outsourced to independent, you know, um, broadcasters, so to speak. Why did the state do this? Do you know how much was involved, who was involved in handling, in outsourcing the coverage of that funeral? So, Chairman, the question is in two parts, uh, about how GBC incurs costs by offering services to the state, and a suggestion that the coverage of the um, funeral rights of His Excellency, the former President, Jerry John Rawlings, was outsourced. So I'll deal with both. Chairman, I firmly believe that GBC costs for uh, state events must be covered. The Director General of GBC would be the first to attest to my insistence that when a state institution asks them to do some program for them, because they know their financial situation, they should ask that state institution to write through the Ministry of Information. Because we also having clarity on their budget can also then begin to say the cost of the satellite link or the cost of the wireless link will be X or Y or Z and at least cover it for them. Then GBC doesn't incur these costs, because those are the costs that are crippling the organization. Chairman, here, Parliament, going through these hearings, um, GBC is required to cover it. Just three or four days ago, Director General uh, copied me in on some communication that was ongoing, that their internet link between here and Broadcasting House had gone down, and if they did not have the opportunity to fix it, they did not have money to go and rent a satellite link. And I recall um, drawing his attention that if he formally wants to, inform, because we can't interfere in the operation, if he formally wants to inform us to have an engagement with Parliament on their behalf, we'll be happy to do. 
So I firmly must have to be covered because we can't continue piling on debts upon debts upon debts. So it's a view that I think we share together. And uh, to the extent that uh, GBC involves the Ministry of Information in requests to cover state items, we will do well to encourage whichever ministry, department, or agency out of their budget to cover at least the cost of the satellite links, etc., because uh, somebody has to pay. The second is this um, suggestion or claim that the coverage was outsourced. That would be incorrect. The coverage was done by state and private media altogether. The arrangements were such that a media village was constructed where all media that was accredited was brought in, local and international. And feed was provided from the inner perimeter where the mortal remains of His Excellency the President uh, was into the media village. And a distribution box was made available for everybody to plug in and take that feed. Why? Because the Jerry Rawlings Foundation and the family requested that they did not want a multiplicity of cameras in the inner perimeter where the mortal remains of His Excellency, the former president, uh, was. And they nominated to us an entity which they said they were comfortable with them being in the inner perimeter and bringing the shots out to everybody. I believe it was not unreasonable to accede to the request of the family of His Excellency, the former president. And I believe that the media, as was all available in the media village, got very clean, distinct feed, and we did not have undignifying photos or shots of His Excellency, our former president. But everybody was allowed coverage. Local and international media was allowed coverage from the media village and around the entire enterprise. The only place where cameras were not allowed, save for the cameras that the family requested to be in there, was the inner perimeter where His Excellency, the former president, was lying in state. So, so just a clarification. So uh, the, the, the village and the entity that provided a feed, understand, my understanding is that it, the, that entity that was responsible for those was recommended by the family which you acceded to. Yes. At, at, at what cost? You didn't. Talk. We have not incurred any expenses on that. Okay. Now to my next question. Um, you have talked about the role of the National Media Commission. And clearly, we all know that the DTT is the future. And as part of the policy, um, there's to be a company set up. Um, that company is supposed to have a board. Per the policy document, the board is to be appointed by the president. Unfortunately, the institutions that are to be represented on the board, um, the NMC is not included in those um, you know, recommended institutions. I'm sure this has come to your attention. Again, the company that has been sidetracked at the Register General is Central Digital Transmission Company Limited. It is listed as a private um, company. Uh, has um, its uh, lawyers as um, the, the secretary to the as um, yeah. So has its uh, secretary to be the Akufuado Premier and Co. And, and others. Has this come to your attention? And do you think this is appropriate? One, the fact that the board does not include the NMC, this company uh, listed as a private entity. Chairman, so um, for the matters you have listed, what has come to my attention, what I've been involved in, is the constitution of the board of the um, Central Digital um, uh, Company. And I have actually um, sent in a recommendation to the Honorable Minister for Communications on our views on how the board should be structured. That and other residual matters to do with the operation of that organization, it is my understanding, were not completed before the first term of the Akufuado administration came to an end. My hope will be that when you approve me. Chairman, just one, uh, I've just heard you make reference to Minister for Communication and your good self on Central Digital 
board? Is it governed by any legislation? That board? Is there a legal framework? Well, Chairman, as we stand now, the board and its constitution, its operation, the entire organization, are matters that were not completed before the term of the previous administration ended. And that is why I said that the one I was aware of and involved in was this constitution of the board. And my expectation is that when you approve me and we do get back in, we can work on these residual matters and tidy them up. Gentlemen, my question is still, uh, I believe, relevant. Parliamentary Service Board, enabling legislation, Article 124 of the Constitution, this Central Digital Broadcasting Board, what is the enabling law supporting its existence and its operation? Thank you. Well, Chairman, at the risk of not going into too much detail, that is what I'm hinting are some of the residual matters which um, were not completed. And my hope is to approve me and I do get in. I'll work with the Honorable Minister to tidy all of those issues up. Now, one for our fraternity, the GJ in Upper East Region. The GJA in Upper East Region. They claim you made a pledge of 10,000 Ghana cities in support of one of their activities. You are yet to redeem, and even on social media, when one of their colleagues prompted you about that pledge made to them, you cause uh, the person to come under so much attack that he had to apologize for reminding you of the need to redeem that pledge to support the GJ with that said amount. What do you have to say to that? <laughs> Chairman, unfortunately, I'm not aware of the social media chatter that my brother um, refers to. I do recall uh, making a pledge to the Upper East um, Regional Branch of the GJ after I traveled to join them in one celebration. And I do recall issuing the instruction uh, to our chief director to ensure that it is satisfied. I would expect that it is satisfied uh, by now. If it is not, I'll be happy to look at it once again. But the social media chatter, with the greatest of respect, uh, I will not be privy to it. Well, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want the nominee to very quickly uh, come with me through his CV very quickly. I'm sure that page one he wanted to communicate to Wasi, page two, the employment history, January 7, 2017, it should be ending January 6, 2021, just for the accuracy of our records, and not January 7, uh, your tenure as MP and as uh, uh, minister, uh, the next entry, that should also be amended to January 6, 2021, because by, by midnight, we all did not have, by midnight of January 6, we all did not have um, portfolios uh, as it were. Page three of your CV, we will also have to clean up President Kufuo as former head of state. We have to capture that accurately with think tanks as well. And the, the final page, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Pram Pram is the address you want to provide. So I believe that these matters can be cleaned up with the clerk uh, moving forward. My first question to the Honorable Nominee relates to a matter you keep stressing, which is validation. We lack validation. We lack, we lack validation of attacks on journalists, and that it shouldn't be I say, you say. I hold in my hands a compilation by the Media Foundation for West Africa, chronicling what they call press freedom violations in Ghana from January 27 to December 2020. They have chronicled as many as 56 of these violations which is staggering. In uh, real essence, it means that on the average, we are talking about one attack a month on the average. And, and, and uh, 
for the four-year period. You'll agree that that is also affecting our global press freedom index and ratings for that matter. Number one place in Africa, 2018, we were 23 out of 180 countries surveyed. We have dropped to number 30. 2019, we dropped four places. 2020, we dropped three places. Then we keep sliding uh, negatively. Will you consider this compilation by the Media Foundation for West Africa a credible validation which you have been requesting for that we need to have? And how are you going to respond to this report and end this rather uh, sad situation that journalists find themselves in. Uh, I don't know if you are conversant with the report, but you see that uh, virtually every non-journalist is featuring here on this list, from Anas to Umaru Sanda, Dela Rosaloklu, and the Dadeti, Latif Idris, Kwachia Fren Yama, Ahmed Hussein Swale, Captain Smart, Abdul Hai Mumin, Winston Amwa, Evans Mensa, Gifty Ando Atia, Philip Osebonsu, Lord Edu Asari, Sandra Obridia, Osei Kwejo, Ophir Femme, and many others. Have you seen this report? And uh, does this constitute enough validation as you are looking for? Chairman, the Media Foundation for West Africa is a very well respected uh, civil society organization in the area of uh, press advocacy and press freedoms. I don't have much basis to doubt what they will put out. Suleimana himself is a very well respected person. Uh, I don't have any basis to doubt what they put out. But I'm sure my brother will agree with me that the validation I'm talking about is not even about the best of works by the best of CSOs. The state must respond to the challenge that we have. And it is within that context that I'm talking about. The state, through the National Media Commission, uh, putting up its debt, it will perhaps be a good complement to what we are all trying to fight. So assurance, what are you going to do? We shouldn't leave matters hanging. So if the Media Foundation for West Africa compilation is not sufficient, and you want something done by NMC, what are you going to do by way of policy? To, because we have to end this. It's getting out of hand. Chairman, um, first of all, I did not say the Media Foundation for West Africa's publication is not sufficient. Um, what I'm suggesting is that the state must have its response, even despite what respected organizations like this do. But Chairman, I've already mentioned that we have put in place a whole coordinated mechanism for the safety of journalists. We have worked with the journalists, GJ, GIBA, NMC, to develop it. It has gone to cabinet. It's received approval with a caveat. NMC should implement it. NMC is seized with it. The Ministry of Information has provided some funding to NMC to go ahead and implement. I think the last um, activity was in November last year on it. Uh, I can see that they don't have enough resources, and that's why when I mentioned it, I said that for all of us who are committed to this, let us also support the NMC so that they are able to deliver on this for our common good. So work has already started. I think what we need to do is all to be committed to that work that has started and to support it so that it succeeds. My second question is to take you back to the response you gave on the mystery $150 airport antigen test by Frontiers Healthcare Services. You told us that the matter was escalated to the tax force and even suggested respectfully that we have been asking the wrong people. If the matter, as you say, was escalated to a multi-sectorial tax force. Is that not the reason why members of that tax force, like the Minister of Health, should know? He directed us to the Ghana Health Service. The procurement minister yesterday directed us to the Minister of Finance. The Attorney General nominee, a governing board member of the Public Procurement Authority, says he has no idea. So you are now today directing us to the Transport Ministry, Within the, the, the confines of Article 21 1F, where the people of this country have the right to information, 
and Honorable, government must be Honorable transparent and accountable. Honorable, uh, Article 211F has been clearly provided with rules yes. how to go about it. Can we take advantage of that so we can move on with this? So, so, so the, 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 the matter is that logically, if the matter is ask, escalated to a multi-sectoral tax force, shouldn't the answer be available multi-sectorially? Shouldn't multiple ministers know about it and be able to help this committee? Chairman, with committee? respect, I don't believe that the question that has been asked, if I am correct and if I've heard what has gone on here well, I don't believe that the question that has been asked is, do you know of it? I believe the question that has been asked of my former colleagues who have been here has been to elicit whether or not they have cited the contract. I believe. It's different from knowing and different from citing the contract. And how the chairman would you and then the procurement process yes. Yes. used yes. in arriving at Frontier. Yes. And now, then the contract. But of all the answers, you are Minister for Information. Yes. You are unlike the others. You are Minister for Information. Yes. And you are also member of the, of the presidential, presidential task force. Yes. What do you know about it? Okay. Chairman, I'll come to that question. I want to uh, quickly respond to the first question from my brother earlier. So, to, first to say that the question has not been, do you know or not? The question has been, among other things, whether or not they have cited a contract. The Minister of Health, if I recall, it, uh, the President's representative of the Health Ministry, if I recall, said that the Presidential Task Force is the one that supervised that enterprise. So he has not cited the contract. The Attorney General designate, I think one also has said he has not cited that contract. The Procurement Minister designates, I think in response to your question, about whether or not she as Procurement Minister designate did not have oversight over it, said that no, oversight over procurement rests with the Finance Ministry. With respect, I don't recall her saying that for the copy of the contract which you asked the finance minister. I think that these were specific questions. But Chairman, my answer I've provided as a member of the Presidential Task Force, and in response to leaders' question, what I do know is that the COVID response program was escalated to the Presidential Task Force level. At that level, the Ghana Airport Company Limited was tasked to explore what testing options it could find that could deliver instant reliable tests as close to PCR and which could therefore allow the reopening of the airport. They then came back to report that they had been able to secure one through an arrangement with a private um, sector organization. And I volunteered the information that the Ghana Airport Company Limited, that did this with respect. It's an agency of the aviation ministry or the transport ministry. I wasn't saying that you were asking wrong people the questions. And therefore, I'm hopeful that when the um, transport minister designate comes, and the question of whether or not he has cited the contract, and even the residual question of why not some other options, he will be best placed to respond. At the task force level, we were briefed, uh, and this is what I'm able to share um, on it. My third question to the nominee. Honorable Vlaka, just a second. Chairman, with your leave, I think Honorable Haruna Idrisu made the point that you are information minister. Are you able to get in touch with Ghana Airport Company Limited to give us some information as to whether there is a contract executed between uh, its office and that of uh, Frontiers Healthcare Services? Well, Chairman, as I mentioned earlier, I believe that the Minister for Transport designates will be appearing before you and will be able to perhaps deliver the closest to first-hand information on it. If I am requested by a committee to engage Ghana Airport Company Limited and fetch a copy of it for, for, for Parliament or for the committee within the rules of what is appropriate, I'm sure I'll be able to oblige that. Mr. Chairman, my final question to the nominee relates to a matter he has been very vocal about and speaks to quite often, the financial sector cleanup. And uh, you have 
indicted the previous government for regulatory weakness and laxities. You have also said that there's a need to take on shareholders and directors who have plunged this country into the significant pain and suffering of many, many of our compatriots. But I have been researching on the list the Bank of Ghana published, the 347 microfinance limited uh, co companies list as published. And I see a company called Oval Microfinance Limited. And looking at page two of your CV, you indicate that between 2014 and 2016, you were managing director of West Brownstone Capital Accra. West Brownstone Capital Limited is listed in the documentation I have here from the DOG as an affiliated company of Over Microfinance Limited, which is one of the companies whose licenses have been revoked by the DOG. And the DOG concerns are that the company valued a two-story building at Pokiasi, owned by Vincent Kojo Pongkroma, shareholder, and has capitalized it without approval from Bank of Ghana. The market value was 1.6 million. Majority shareholder Vincent Kojo Pongkroma transferred all shares 82% to West Brownstone Capital Limited, an affiliate of Over Microfinance Limited, without approval from Bank of Ghana. Companies registered approved paid up capital by Bank of Ghana was 100,000 Ghana cities as of 30 September 2017 and was below the statutory requirement of 2 million for all tier 2 microfinance companies. The company's paid up capital was impaired due to persistent losses arising from poor loan recovery and high operational costs, contrary to Section 28.1 of the Banks and Specialized Deposit Taking Institutions Act 2016 at 930. The net owned funds was negative 5.161 million. The company's capital depreciation ratio was 487.46%. Non performing loss of 1.4 million. The company failed to honor its statutory payments such as staff income tax and social security and national insurance trust contribution to its workers since January 2017. The company defaulted maintenance of primary reserves. The company was rated critical. The company was insolvent. This is the examination report. And the directors here, Kwame Opon Kuma, Mark Ben Edu Asamoa, Patrick Kinsley Nina, Gerard Edu Jemfi. How do you respond to this report? And how do you assure Ghanaians that this whole financial sector cleanup and the punishment of persons or, or sanctions being meted out to persons who caused this is being done fairly? and nobody, uh, including your good self, is being left off the hook. Persons who caused this is being done fairly, and nobody, uh, including your good self, is being left off the hook. Chairman, thank you. Um, yes, I have spoken uh, on behalf of government about the financial sector cleanup exercise. Um, we have been at pains to explain the various reasons uh, that occasioned the difficulties in the financial services sector, including, as uh, my brother mentioned, uh, questions of regulation, etc. Yes, Chairman, he is right. Um, between 2014 and 2016, my private business um, invested uh, this organization as uh, the largest shareholding entity in this organization. Um, between, I think, 2017 and 2019, the directors and management reported to us that they were having difficulties and requested of us to recapitalize the organization. I was not in a position to inject any further capital. The uh, outline that you have mentioned talks about my personal investments in the company. I was not in a position to invest any further capital in the organization. And the Bank of Ghana, after it adjusted the statutory requirements for capital, 
because the requirements for entry was not the same as they kept adjusting, I came to the view that they were in breach of what the new statutory requirement was. Uh, as I mentioned, I as a shareholder, and indeed many of the other shareholders, could not um, reinvest in the organization as was being required by the directors and uh, the management. And the Bank of Ghana effectively revoked its uh, license accordingly. I believe the second part of your question will deal with whether or not there's any impropriety that is found on the part of the directors or managers or shareholders. And to that extent, I'm not sure that the report before you suggests so. The report suggests that West Brownstone is a beneficiary of uh, what is known in the industry as uh, I'm looking for the, that, that page of the, of the report, but essentially that, that as shareholder, you were, you were given some money, uh, about uh, 212,000, and actually you are the, amongst the top 20 uh, defaulting customers, West Brownstone is number one. Uh, Chairman, I'm not sure that uh, will be accurate. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, West Brownstone was not indebted to the uh, organization as at um, the time that uh, the Bank of Ghana was conducting its exercise. So, so there was no uh, internal uh, party lending in this instance? There was no outstanding liability. I'm grateful, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I also wish to congratulate the Honorable Minister nominee. Honorable Minister, social media has been referred to today in terms of its negative impact and abuse. But social media has now become an integral part of communication. How do you intend to use social media? You have already referred to the Afrobarometer report, which states that at least a third of Ghanaians are looking to digital information and communication. How do you intend to use social media as a medium to educate and inform Ghanaians about government policies and programs and to seek their feedback on the governance process? Chairman, thank you. Um, I think as I mentioned at my last appearance before your committee, Social media cannot be ignored in the communication enterprise. And for that reason, um, we, for example, at the ministry, set up our own social media unit, which today I think has been able to recruit about 1.2 million uh, individual Ghanaians and therefore is able to reach out to them directly. We've also encouraged ministries, departments, and agencies and actually supported them in having dedicated social media channels that are able to direct with the Ghanaian public. Our expectation will be that moving forward, we're able to extend that even to the retail level to include specifically uh, members of parliament and other high ranking uh, officials that people expect to receive or uh, consume information from. But in so doing, ensure that their accounts and their handles are verified uh, so that the risk of uh, people utilizing it for other purposes is curtailed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, during your tenure as uh, Substantive Minister for Information, we saw a tremendous transformation of some of the agencies under you, like the Ghana Publishing Corporation, a lot of physical infrastructure changes and equipment. Unfortunately, some of the other agencies like GBC, and I kindly respectfully request of you to visit GBC in Kumasi the next time you are there, uh, their facilities require some facelift, and I believe some other regional GBC offices. Is there any plans to look to upgrade some of the physical infrastructure of GBC across the country? Chairman, yes, it's a question of resourcing, but as I hinted earlier, the National Media Commission is leading a GBC reorganization program. 
Our expectation is that out of that program, there will be clarity in terms of the legislation, in terms of the resource requirements, and we'll be able to do this exercise of reinvesting in uh, GBC and some of the other uh, state-owned media organizations. Yes, and the Right to Information Bill was passed under you as Minister. I know you have done a lot. Can you briefly tell us the status of implementation and what measures will be taken to educate Ghanaians on how to take advantage of the right to information? Well, in my responses earlier, I outlined the many things that the RTI um, division has recreated at the Information Service Department has achieved and the benefits that have come out um, of that. I think one of the outstanding items, I mentioned some items are outstanding, is public education on it. If you don't complete the internal work and you uh, make a lot of noise about it publicly, what ends up happening is that um, you cannot deliver even on your uh, brand promise to users. So having come to the end of the internal exercises that must take place, we'll be looking to do a lot more of the public education so that people can know where to go for information, how to apply for it, how to seek redress if they feel they are challenges. Chairman, may I also mention that the RTI Commission has been um, set up. The board, the governing board has been sworn in by His Excellency the President, and they have commenced uh, their work. They are taking leadership in working with us to develop the legislative instrument that is required to flesh out the gaps in the RTI Act. Yes, Thank you very much, Honorable Chairman. First, Honorable Nominee, let me ask you, um, former staff of GBC who have gone on retirement for the past years been fighting for the payment of their end of service entitlements over a period about, for most about a year now, Faithful servants of this country, like Getulio Leo Pariado, Esther Sinofred, Kumasi, and the rest, have been traversing your office without any attention. What really is the problem? Why are they not being paid their end of service awards? Well, Chairman, if the suggestion is made that they have been traversing my office without any attention, I would respectfully say that that suggestion would be incorrect. Uh, I have had a meeting with them here in my office in Parliament where they outlined their challenges and served me with a document which I ferried to the GBC Director General and then I think to the Board Chair of GBC. Chairman, as I've mentioned earlier, when dealing with state-owned media, you have to be extra careful. The National Media Commission takes leadership in their matters. This is a particular matter that, if my recollection is accurate, they have, I think, a collective bargaining agreement or some union structures that um, create some benefits for them. The challenge has been how they will fund those benefits at their company level. And uh, they have quite a significant backlog of uh, people who have worked there and who they expect to benefit from this, I think, union agreement or CBA, who are not benefiting uh, from it. Our expectation, Chairman, is that under the reorganization program and the resources that can hopefully be made available under that program, we can satisfy some of those obligations that GBC itself is struggling to uh, satisfy. Between their, um, may I say, representation to me, and then, what I've done is to bring their issue to the limelight, to the quarters that matter, uh, that if some resourcing can be made available and prioritized, maybe in terms of age, um, to begin to dispose of it while we're waiting for a substantive uh, answer, it won't be a bad idea. Chairman, permit me another GBC question, because you should know. The Bible says go back go to the first Go with your second question, please. So, um, in an answer, to a previous question, you mentioned the training of good spokespersons on various sectors. Mm -hmm. I want to ask, why would you go out to recruit the spokespersons when we already have the Information Service Department staff trained and also 
even GBC rural radio stations out there who can easily communicate government policies and programs. Chairman, thank you. I think the simple answer is that some of the areas are technical. For example, we are about to have a vaccination rollout program. Vaccination rollout program comes with things like ultra freeze temperature management, uh, logistics, and other things, which are very technical, but which for the purposes of what we are doing require some mass communication. I am not even equipped, um, even after my years in this enterprise, etc., to be the one to lead this technical aspect of the communication. And so are many aspects of our national life developing and requiring that we have people who are well skilled to lead that kind of communication enterprise. And so the reason for which we will be uh, looking to invest in these five um, spokespersons uh, is to mirror them to each of the five subcategories of cabinet so that for the various sectors, infrastructure is a technical area, security is a technical area, general administration is another area, uh, as I mentioned, social services, including health, etc. they can do um, that bridging of the gap at the top level. That is not to say that at the ground level or across to uh, the ground, you are going to be recruiting spokespersons. No, we are talking about these five um, subcategories of cabinet uh, so that they can help regularly interact, provide the answers that the media is looking for in these areas. Same on GBC, with my past experience. For time now, GBC has had problems covering for Ghanaians, for the benefit and enjoyment of Ghanaians, certain very important sporting activities and events. For example, a Ghanaian is involved in a world title fight, the Olympic Games, and the rest. It becomes almost difficult for GBC able to send these signals to our rural areas like the Chairman's constituency. Because of the commercial interest involved in this, the GBC is said to go out there and compete with other private institutions to get sponsorship for these things, which normally is not the case. GBC has a public there is a social responsibility to the Ghanaian. What are you going to do to make sure that at least government in its um, responsibility towards the Ghanaian takes or helps GBC to be able to also do this or discharge this responsibility to the Ghanaian populace? Chairman, I think it's about rights building a consortium, getting advertising resources or resources to pay for it. In the last major tournament, I don't quite recall the, the name of the tournament, um, when, when, when I was approached by what they call the consortium, I invited all of them to a meeting and opted to assist them in two ways. First, for the state to pre-finance the rights, and second, for the consortium to commercialize the rights so that we can at least refund what the state had paid. And I think we were able to recoup, I dare say, about 90% of what the state um, invested. And my suggestion to them, and again, because GBC, state-owned media, you can't dictate, you can't um, direct them what to do. My suggestion to them was to make that consortium permanent. So a consortium on sporting rights, made up of public and private media here in Ghana, so that when these big events or these big sports games, etc., are coming up and the uh, consortium is interested, the government can assist by prepaying and can assist them to ensure that we sell to all of these private entities that are looking for the same eyeballs, and then that money can be refunded. Uh, it is a proposal we've made available to, to them. They promise that they will come back um, on it. I expect uh, that if I do resume office, they will come back and we'll be able to act on it accordingly. My last question, Chairman. There was recent Kula Balu about your ministry, one of your ministries, let me say Ministry of Communication and the National Communication Authority. One of, one of I mean government his ministries. I'm not saying he speaks ministry. for government. Honorable, did you say one of his ministries? No, one of government's ministries. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, taking back or appropriating 
some of these old frequencies and uh, channels that have been reserved for GBC since long, from which one, of, one was given to multimedia to get you to work there. Huh? I said one of the frequencies is what Joy has used in the time past to get you a job to do. <laughs> oh, I'm coming to my question. Why in a hurry? <laughs> what was your reaction to that? And do you think it was necessary for that attempt in the first place? Chairman, just a quick correction. Um, no, I did not um, work on any of the channels that had, or any of the DTT channels that had been given um, by GBC out. I worked at multimedia on 99.7, which was an arrangement earlier between GBC and them. But the issue you are talking about are the DTT um, transmission channels on their multiplex, if I'm correct. So, Chairman, you would recall that um, with the advent of DTT, and various technologies, there are different transmission companies. So there's multi-TV that transmits, there's DSTV that transmits. In fact, GBC TV has what we call the T1. That has about 11 or 12 other channels on it. Um, I think when COVID came and we were looking for channels, it was even GBC T1 that had one redundancy channel. And I mentioned it as part of the successes we've talked, that they were able to create um, the learning channel which helped us pretty well. My understanding is that the uh, operators of the DTT channel under the Ministry of Communications sought to create redundancies on their platform and invited all the stations that had more than, I think, one or two channels to a meeting and explained to them the rationale and suggested that they should go back, engage with their boards and management, think through it, so that in the end, they could keep their two most important channels on it, and then redundancies could be created. Now, Chairman, you recall that GBC, for example, operates all of its six channels on the T1 platform and has even added other private channels onto it. GBC has one channel on the DSTV platform, and I believe, I think on Star Times and other platforms. It was unfortunate that after that initial conversation with GBC, what came out was news reportage that the Minister of Communications had instructed GBC to shut down six channels. I don't think that that was an accurate reflection of the conversation that was going on. I think GBC petitioned the National Media Commission, and I wrote a brief to inform the National Media Commission on what I knew about the situation and how I thought we could resolve it. Um, Thankfully, the matter has not been retired. You'll recall that um, as part of the engagements that were ongoing, the president instructed that um, the processes be halted for some further consultations. And I believe all the representations that have been made, including the brief that I sent in, will all be factored in in resolving the matter. The second level of the question, do you think it's necessary? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Do you think Patricia, the second level of the question has not been answered? Do you think that exercise is really necessary? Honorable Patricia PJP. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, congratulations once again. The Honorable Mr. Chairman, the Honorable nominee, in an earlier submission, made a very interesting but factual statement that the media provides sunlight that helps our democracy grow. Mr. Chairman, it is widely known that one critical challenge confronting the media industry is capacity building. Your predecessor, when he attended to the House in 2017, gave us an assurance that is going to actually uh, deploy some of the funds for media development, the media development fund, to address this challenge. 
You've also mentioned um, a scheme. But you, you, you mentioned an enhancement, media enhancement scheme. Uh, I'll be very interested if you can uh, expatiate on this scheme for the benefit of this house. Thank you, so that we know exactly where you're going. Chairman, thank you. Chairman, very briefly, it is actually the same thing. Initially, there was a conversation of a media development fund. Indeed, the previous administration attempted it, uh, administered it in a particular manner. When we assumed office, when I was deputy minister, uh, the minister at the time worked to see if we could revive that fund for it to uh, progress. And it's in that light that he made those representations. Eventually, when we settled on, and by the time I was in the chair, was the Media Capacity Enhancement Program, which is a targeted response by helping to put whatever resources that government can find and can mobilize to use in terms of helping to build the capacity of uh, 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 practicing media persons. Now, because government doesn't want to be the one determining the content, etc., what we did was to set up a working group made up of people within the industry and academia and to um, create a framework where we can provide them with the resources for them to actually go about the exercise of doing the administering of the Capacity Enhancement Program, and we look forward to it taking full flight in the second term. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I just want to find out from the nominee in an answer to an earlier question about the 56 incidents of attack on the media over the period 2017-2020, and our ranking from 20, uh, 23rd position 2018 to 30th, he mentioned a lot about what National Media Commission is doing to enhance media freedom in our country. I just want to find out from him, over this period that you were there, you were deputy and then successive minister, what concrete steps have you taken or have you put in place to enhance media freedom in our country? Chairman, I've mentioned two specific programs under my leadership, which the expectation is us are being institutionalized, will lead us to eventually overcome this challenge. One is the coordinated mechanism for the safety of journalists which we believe is a big response to protecting media freedoms. That is the one that I've said that we drew up the program working with the NMC, GIJ, GJA, GIBA, and out of that came up with a cabinet memo, went to cabinet, got approval with the caveat that NMC should implement and not us. And we have provided resources to the NMC and they are on the path to fully executing it. And I used this committee's hearing as a platform to appeal to all who are interested in protecting media freedoms to help support the NMC, including financially and with resources, so that they can excel in utilizing it. Mr. Chairman, that's where my worry is, because this program, as you may be aware, had been there before you got your ministry. Which one? The coordinating? Yes, yes, the National Comprehensive Framework on Safety of Journalism. No, I'm not aware of this. And it is very, this is a program, as I'm speaking about, that no. we conceptualized right from the beginning. Right. Our, our, our media colleagues themselves will tell you about the meetings we had at uh, Anissa Hotel, etc., to put it together. So this is not the national um, uh, comprehensive, the comprehensive framework. How different mm -hmm. is that from what was well, there? Well, I don't even know about it. So that's how come I don't even and know. My worry is that it for is. four years, if we've not been able to get its full implementation. What guarantee are you giving us that in the next four years, if given the nod, this will be fully implemented? Chairman, I've been minister for two years, and in this two-year period um, is when the crisis itself escalated, during which period I've had to put in place this response. My hope is that in the next four years, we all will be able to get some support and resourcing for the NMC to fully execute it. The, chairman, the, second, the second is the Media Capacity Enhancement Program, which is aimed at building or enhancing capacity. The media has outstanding capacity, but we need to build on it. 
Uh, and that is the other one that I spoke to uh, as well. Again, for that as well. But that is being led by us directly, but the working group on it uh, is the one that is uh, executing directly. Mr. Simon, on 30th May 2018, you and I own colleague, you and I, our colleague, Honorable Kennedy Japan, sat on his radio station and TV, and out of anger from the investigative journalism of uh, Tiger IPI, made a lot of comments, some even attacks, and suggested that persons, I mean, if I may quote in three, he said, if you meet him anywhere, slap him mercilessly. Yes, I said it. Beat him. He added, this is a matter, I mean, this is a matter of public. Yeah. What were, at the time, even though I know at that time you were a deputy minister at that, uh, in that sector, Sorry, what did that you said do? That? Come again. I, I had a quote. Who was, who was being quoted? I was quoting Kenny Japan. And I said that even though during that time he was a deputy minister, what did you do when the member of parliament was issuing all these threats? Well, Chairman, that specific matter, as I'm sure you are aware, is still the subject of ongoing police investigation. I would pray your indulgence that I do not make any comments on it. Well, Mr. Chairman, will he agree that such acts are attacks on media freedom? Chairman, I think in my earlier responses, I have said quite clearly that no amount of harassment or verbal or physical attacks should be inflicted on the media, even if we think that it is indulging in what some may describe as irresponsible conduct. Because for some, it is because that is the only way they know. And what we ought to do is to support them with training and resources so that they get on the right path. I believe that uh, my comments express clearly how I feel about that matter. So you agree that that was an attack on media freedom? Chairman, as I mentioned, I, I, I believe that my comments express uh, how I feel on that matter. So you agree that that was an attack on media freedom? Honorable, um, Mr. Chairman, this is a very straightforward yes, no. Because you have said, the Constitution has said so, and you have also expressed that yes, regardless of whatever happened, harassment, attack, and probably even West murder, I don't remember, I I think you can make there. your own interpretation from his statement that if you, you agree, is asking for an opinion, which you know are rules on them. So your interpretation is up to you, but please leave him out of that. Yes, so I just want to hear you. So you agree that that. Action. Chairman, it goes without saying, I have, I, have, I have expressed how I feel about it. I believe it goes without saying that, yes, that is my position. Now, unfortunately, even though you yourself, you were a practitioner, and at that time you were a deputy minister, I never heard you condemn this. Why? Well, Chairman, the truth is that at that material moment, I honestly was not aware of this matter until after the fact, when all of these things came up. Chairman, there are 502 radio stations across the country. Not everything that happens on those platforms come to my attention in real time. In this particular instance, as you talk about, I believe even for many of us, it was after the fact that the associated matters became publicly known. So it will not be out of 10 that you would not have heard me at that time because it, it was not something I was aware of. But when it did come out, with the videos and the comments. I never heard you. Because when it did that. come up, it was also now a matter of a, a subject of police investigation, and I cannot prejudice that. No, but condemning an act does not in any way interfere with investigation. Condemning the act, Chairman, we have today before you, I have extensively spoken about why I do not believe that media should be attacked or harassed in any way. I think my position on that is very clear. But on a specific matter that was under investigation at the time it came to public limelight, um, I pray my leader to bear with me that it would not have been appropriate for me to be speaking on ongoing investigations. Mr. Chairman, for the avoidance of doubt, I've heard him speak earlier on the murder of uh, Ahmed Swale and how you were saying that's the perception that is even you yourself, yourself, that's also the impression that you're also carrying. The suspicion 
it's been over two years. Has government found any contrary position to the fact that he was murdered because of the work that he did? The police have not told us so. So, so long as we are concerned, he was murdered because of the work that he did, and that was attack on the... Yeah, yeah that's a policy. suspicion that we are all operating with. So you agree... Including that, myself. It, including it, myself. That's a suspicion that we are all operating with. So you agree with the international uh, uh, press freedom when they add the murder of Ahmed Swale as part of those who have died on, in, the, in the line of their duty? To the extent that no contrary evidence has been provided, yes, I would agree with them. Honorable what is the basis of that conclusion? Have they provided any evidence to suggest that? Evidence has been provided to suggest otherwise. I will not fault an international organization that therefore proceeds on the generally suspected view and adds it to their rankings. What do you then say to those who claim that, well, it's sad, it's unfortunate for people to say that the murder of Ahmed Swale is an attack on press freedom? What do you say to people who claim that it is sad and unfortunate that the murder of Ahmed Swale is being counted as attack on media freedom? Well, I think that they need to understand the context within which uh, some of these statistics, etc., are put to, uh, together. Because unless you have some contrary evidence, the generally suspected view is what will be applied in this case. But this is also why, Chairman, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to have a mechanism that helps us to validate, to track, to follow up, to put pressure on the entities that must work. So do you remember the President saying this himself? The, the President, our President saying this himself? Saying what? That it's unfortunate that the death of Ahmed Swale is being uh, associated with attack on uh, uh, media freedom. If those are his words, I think that is also understandable because like I've explained, you either have contrary evidence or how those who are accounting for it on the global platforms will do will be to add it. But for the president of our country, where we are constitution and as people, we tout ourselves in the freedom of expression of the individual, do you think that this was a good thing for the president to say that uh, it's sad and unfortunate that people are associating the death of Ahmed Swale to uh, attack on uh, press freedom. Yes, because it would have been best if the police had come to a conclusion on that investigation so that that matter can be settled. To that extent that it is not done, it's a sad spectacle. Honorable Nomini, do you remember in July 2019 in London during the Global Media Freedom Conference, this is what you said. It is very disappointing that a case of Ahmed Swale as high profile like that which worked as back on press freedom has remained unresolved. Why did you, and unquote, why did you say this, work as back on press freedom if you were, if you didn't believe or if you will support those who say it is sad and unfortunate that his death is being associated with because, with Chairman, consistent freedom. with the conversation we've been having, until you have contrary evidence, it will be added and it will walk us back. Now, as the Minister for Information and also uh, uh, maybe a former practitioner in the media setting, since the death of Ahmed Swale, has there, is there any steps that you have taken to help speed up the investigation? Because it's been two years, it's about two years and no information is yeah. coming from there. Chairman, the okay. President's uh, representative at the Ministry for the Interior will be the first to attest to the regularity of my uh, queries to him on how far they have come uh, on that. As you do know, investigations are within the ambit of um, uh, the police that is under the Interior Ministry. I cannot bypass him and go directly to the agencies. But he will be the first um, to speak to the regularity with which I request for an update from him. Because the truth is that it's not a pleasant thing for that thing to be hanging around um, our press freedom record. It will be important for the police to come to the bottom of it, find the persons responsible, and uh, bring them to account. I do concede that sometimes investigations take time, even in the best of uh, uh, police environments, but I think we cannot stop 
but continuously remind the police that that is an outstanding matter that must be resolved. Mr. Mr. Chairman, when a journalist on Munti FM is said to have threatened the life of the president, if, can you hear me? I'm saying that when a journalist on Munti FM is alleged to have threatened the life of the president, he was arrested and he's facing trial. When the, the Honorable Fusu Ampofu, the national chairman of NDC, is alleged to have threatened the chair of EC, he is facing trial. So why is our colleague, Honorable Kenneth who is who said all he did before the murder of Ahmed Swale, is not facing trial? Chairman, with respect, the police and the prosecutorial authorities will be the best place to answer that question. I am incapable of providing an answer to that. Mr. Chairman, I often hear you ad advise, advising journalists and media organizations to practice responsible journalism in their media organization. Is that right? Most of the time, when you are talking to your colleagues, I, I keep hearing you no, say No, that is not correct, Chairman. One of the first things I speak about is the safety of journalists. Today before you, the first program I've spoken about is the coordinated mechanism for the safety of journalists. Today before you, I have been extensively advocating for media freedoms and why we should protect and support journalists. So if there's a supposition that I'm only heard uh, advising or calling for responsible journalism, that is an incorrect supposition. Mr. Chairman, I want to take him to the independence of the state-owned media and national media commission. Mr. Chairman, and, I mean, they all made reference to the chapter 12 of the Constitution, the state-owned media, graphic, GBC, Times, GNA, are supposed to be insulated from government control. To ensure this, the Constitution plays the management and oversight of this state-owned media under the National Media Commission. That is why, even though the state-owned media are seen as agencies under information ministry, which he has, or he, he was the, uh, the minister then, it is the National Media Commission and not any minister that appoints the board of the state-owned media and the board in turn appoints the director general of the state-owned media. Are you aware of the letter that was written by the Minister for Communication to the Director General of Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, GBC, directing GBC to seed or give out three of their digital broadcasting channels? Are you aware? Yes, Your Honor, I think I answered that and gave an elaborate account of um, what my understanding of it was and what the current situation is. I just want to find out where whether you as the Minister for Information was consulted, whether the Minister for Communication did consult you as the Minister for Information, who I wouldn't want to say play oversight over GBC, but GBC is one of the agencies under you. Did she consult you? Chairman, I've already explained that the narrative out there that the Minister directed GBC to shut down six channels is not correct. The minister invited GBC and a number of, at least one other station that had more than two channels on their multiplex to a meeting and discussed with them the need to have redundancies and gave them, if I'm correct, I think an eight week period within which they should consult their boards and management on which of their channels they could seed and the two that they would like to keep on the platform. It was during this period that this story came out that the minister had directed them to shut down six of their channels. So, Chairman, I think that that must be put in its right context. But specifically to answer your question, the minister consulted me that she intends to have a conversation with the channel operators to explore how they could create redundancies on the multiplex platform. So I was surprised when I saw the story out there that the minister had instructed them to shut down their channel because the minister cannot do that. Are you saying that there's no any letter from the Minister for Communication to the Director General of GBC to this effect? It was only in a meeting and discussions. Chairman, I have cited a letter from the minister to the director general, capturing the conversation that took place at the meeting and reiterating the fact that in eight weeks' time they should revert on which uh, of their channels they would cede and which of the two channels they would like to keep. 
That I have cited. But a letter that says that shuts down six of your channels, I have not cited any. And Mr. Chairman, you think that you being the minister under which the agency TVC is, was not the one to do that, but the Minister for Communication should just inform you to go ahead to do that, and you think that that is right? Chairman, the DTT platform is not operated by the Ministry responsible for information. It's a platform operated under the Ministry of Communications. It is their platform, like DSTV belongs to MultiChoice, or MultiTV belongs to, I think, Knet, or any other transmission platform. So I could not have been the one creating redundancies on a, a transmission platform that is not under my supervision, number one. Number two, what the minister did was to consult me that this is what she desires to do in consultation with her team on that platform that is managed by them, and that she would like to engage with GBC on how to do that, and she proceeded so to do. And so the letter I cited, Chairman, as I mentioned, essentially was about that engagement. I have not cited a letter that says that shut down six channels, and that's why I make the distinction. Mr. Chairman, I want to find out from you whether the National Media Commission, whose mandate under our constitution was to oversight GBC, was consulted. Uh, Chairman, I believe that that would be appropriately put to the communications um, minister. I was consulted. Because they are an agency under you, that was why I asked you, and you said that you were informed by the Minister of Communication. So you should be able to be in the known to know whether National Media Commission was consulted. Well, Chairman, as I mentioned, in my opinion, respectfully, the best person to respond to that will be the Minister for Communications. So you are not aware whether the uh, National Media Commission was consulted or not? Chairman, I have not said so. I have suggested that so the I'm best asking you whether respond, you were aware they were consulted or not. to respond to whether or not they were consulted will be the Minister responsible for communication. No, but you are working with both the National Media Commission and the GBC. And you said here that the minister did talk to you or consulted you before engaging Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. And I'm asking you whether you are in the noon that she did consult National Media Commission. This is a very simple yes or no. Well, Chairman, I do not have any information to that effect. So, so you are not sure whether she did or she didn't? I do not have any information. Honorable Chief, please move on. He has answered that question about five times. What would you say to, the, to those who say the attempt to take over the channels of Ghana Broadcasting Corporation without consulting the National Media Commission was a usurpation of the powers of the National Media Commission and an attempt to disregard the National Media Commission in the affairs of the state broadcasters? Chairman, if there was no consultation, then that would be the case. But as I mentioned, I am not able to respond to that question as I said before you. What will you do as a sector minister if approved to avert a situation of their, some of the attendance being taken in future? Chairman, as I've mentioned, there's a GBC reorganization program which includes which platforms they'll be operating on, how many of their channels they intend to put on those uh, platforms, how they'll be funded, what their legislation says. It's an entire program that the National Media Commission is uh, leading for us to execute. It's my expectation that that program will respond to uh, all of these outstanding concerns about GBC. Others are of the view that our current structure where the National Communication Authority authorizes and uh, supervises the authorization certificate of frequent, uh, what we call frequencies to FM stations and TV stations should be something that should have rather been under the National Media Commission. What, do you, what is your view on this? As in the frequency authorization? Yes, authorizations. Chairman, I don't share that view. Oh. Why? Because the usage of frequency is not just by media. And so a body that is dedicated to the management of frequency distinct from the National Media Commission, which is a constitutional creature with its functions, is the best placed body to handle authorization matters. Mr. Chairman, in an earlier answer to your question about the Central Digital Transmission Company Limited, 
He said the process was not completed, and he believed that the implementation had started. Just for the awareness of doubt, I just want to be sure whether this was a public entity or a private entity. Um, honestly, Chairman, my recollection of the type of entity is not very clear. I honestly do not recall what type of entity that it was. There were, and that's why in answer to the earlier question, I said the parts of that conversation that I recall include the constitution of the board, which I wrote to the Honorable Minister about, which we are in the process of working on. Unfortunately, it could not be completed before the term ended. And this company was supposed to more or less regulate the flow of the TV channels in the country, is that right? No, if, not I, if I had the Minister for Communication right, even though she's not sitting in the chair, that it was just providing an asphalt for every vehicle to be able to pass on, whether it is an articulator or a Kia or a, a taxi, so that it's just a provision of asphalted road that will be assessed by everybody. Chairman, my recollection is that the Central Digital Transmission Company Limited is not a regulator. It's a transmission service company where companies that are authorized plug in and transmit their content through their equipment. So you are not sure whether it's a, <clears throat> it's a public entity or a private entity? You could answer Chairman, I have clearly. answered earlier by suggesting that my recollection of the type of entity is not clear. I do not recall uh, what type of entity it was. What I recall was to do with the issues of the board constitution, which uh, I made representations, and which and other matters are still residual matters that we expect. Now, Mr. Chairman, if you were sending reps to a board, I thought it's only fair that you should be interested in knowing which board you are sending your representative well, on. Chairman, we were not sending reps to the board. We were having a, compos a conversation about the composition of the board of the company. And we made representations to that effect of what we think the board of the company ought to look like and who should be on the board. That is the furthest that we went on that conversation. And when, when this company is also going to include some of the state-owned media passing through it, wouldn't you be worried to find out what kind of board it was going to be? Well, Chairman, as I've mentioned in our consultations, we're not at that stage yet. We're talking about who ought to be on this board when it is created. And those were the representations that we were going through. Because if it was going to involve state-owned state -owned media, I mean, as a member of parliament, as minister of state, as a media practitioner yourself, you want to be saying that, oh, then let's refer to the act that established it, so that we can see what the act says, who and who should be on it. But once we are proposing persons on the rate, there's no any legislative, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, there's no any existing law or uh, instrument that was guiding that. Obviously, you should be worried as a minister. Yes, Chairman, that's why, that is why I've said that there are residual matters that need to be dealt with on that particular project. And my understanding is that it has not been completed. And, for example, these concerns that the Honorable Member raises, I believe, can all be accommodated in the conversations that will ensue. Would you say that, even though this was asked earlier about the absence of National Media Commission being on that uh, board, would you say that such, an, com, such a company, organization, or agency should rather be operating under the National Media Commission? No, Chairman, I would not say you should be operating under the National Media Commission. No, I haven't said you said. I'm saying that I'm of the view that if it's going to be providing uh, access for television channels and what have you, because of our constitutional structure, this should rather be under National Media Commission. Yes, and Chairman, I'm saying that I do not share that view. I believe that the National Media Commission must have a role to play. I have made representations on how I think that should be structured, or let me see, my ministry has made representations. We are in the process of having those uh, conversations on those residual matters. I don't think we should prejudice it uh, by trying to resolve it here on this floor. As I mentioned, with your leave, if I do get into that office, I believe we can deal with those residual matters. Mr. Chairman, I, will you be surprised if I show you the profile of the uh, Central Digital Transmission Company Limited? 
and on their registered profile, it shows that they were going to be a private entity. Will you be surprised? That they were going to they be were registered, a private They were registered to, to partake a private activity. Well, Chairman, as I've mentioned, the knowledge that I have of this matter is the discussions that are ongoing. If there's any additional information, if it's made available to me, I believe that we can factor it into the residual conversations. If, after you leave here, you confirm that this is a private entity, will you advise a private entity to be doing this that involves state-owned media and other property or, or yeah, other property that are, are state-owned? Chairman, uh, I think like the expression goes, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. When we are seized with all the rationalization and the reasons for whatever proposals this may be, we'll have an opportunity to have a discussion on it. Well, Honorable Nomni, do you own any media house in Ghana? Yes, oh. I do. What's the name? I own um, ABC Communications Limited, or I'm a shareholder in ABC Communications Limited that operates a radio station in Achimoda. What of uh, MX24? MX24. That will be a television station. Yeah, is it, is it yours or do you have a share in it? No, I do not have shares in it. Did you apply in last parliament for uh, me members holding profit? Uh, yes, I did, you and did. was certified as such. So you, you did yes. just to be sure, be sure that you can carry out your business uh, activities? Absolutely. Only the chairman, just uh, have you declared your assets as required under the 1992 constitution? Yes, I have on the assumption of office thank and you. upon the exit of office. All right, thank you. So, Mr. Nomni, Mr. Chairman, so in that case, you are both a policy maker and over, you oversight, and you are also a participant in the media, in the media arena. Um, when you say participant, you mean as a shareholder? Yes. Well, yes, to that extent, yes, I'm a shareholder. So you are both a, a policymaker and somebody who oversights, and you also a participant? Well, as I've explained, to the extent that I'm a shareholder, I'm one of the shareholders, you can say so. Mr. Chairman, I just want to find out the television station, when was the frequency issued? When was the frequency issued? The frequency for the television MX24 issued? I, I would not know. But is it when you were minister for communication, uh, minister for information? I would not know. I am not a shareholder of that company. I would not know. You are not a shareholder in the no. MX24. No, no. Yes, Mr. during the COVID and its uh, reportage, since the outbreak, I mean. Government extended, has government extended any financial assistance to any media houses that you know? Chairman, no, not that I'm aware of. I have made representations that where funding is available and is possible, um, we should support the media uh, because one, the media has been taking a lot of risks, uh, going out there interviewing people associated with COVID in these risky times, and two, COVID and the economic slowdowns also affected uh, how the media business is operating. Uh, I am advised that as resources improve and as we continue to support various sectors of the economy, that will be considered. Uh, Chairman, in an answer to an earlier question about the presidential tax force, you said that you were not privy to the nitty gritties of the agreement. Is that what, is that understanding? I've never used the word nitty gritties here, Chairman. I have not said so. You say you are not, uh, you are not privy to the details. Is that what I, you said? I have not said so. I have explained my participation at the task force, the instruction to the Ghana Airport Company Limited, what they did and the detail that they brought back to the task force. And I have suggested that the transport minister uh, may be in a position to provide any further details that this committee may be looking But you don't have any details on, on the agreement, do you? No, I do not have details on the agreement. And since the issue became topical, people were talking about it. I mean, the minority then issued a press statement and a press conference. You never find it necessary to, to find the details as information minister. The, the brief as I have is sufficient to me. 
if there are any specific details that uh, I may be required to look for, maybe if you ask of some specific detail that ordinarily I should have, maybe I can answer you on that one. Uh, when the company, the Frontier Health Service Limited, was registered in Ghana, do you have that information? No. And about, whether about, they have operated about when any, the company was registered in Ghana? Yes. In whether Ghana they have Ghana. operated any laboratory in Ghana? No, because they are not details that in the ordinary course of my work it will come to my attention or that uh, are required to be known at this point in time. I have not heard so far any claims, for example, that the procurement was done out of order or that there's anything questionable about this organization to arouse my interest in going fishing but um, honorable for that. Um, nominee, you are a lawyer. You said so. In an ordinary agreement, would those details be contained in any such agreement? I'm not even sure, Chairman, if the recitals will be in that agreement. It's not likely I mean, even if it there. will be in the recitals of that agreement, I'm not sure. But Mr. Chairman, the interesting thing is that when issues come up from any government sector, normally here you, you come out, you articulate, and you try to get the final details to be able to feed the public about their doubts, about what the facts are. But I'm surprised that when it came to these frontier health services, most of the questions that have been asked, the, the procurement method that was used, who are the owners, do they operate in a laboratory, how are they operating at the airport? What, how did they arrive at their charges? You don't find it necessary to acquire this information and be able to educate the public? Educate the public chairman on when the company was incorporated, etc., may not necessarily be what I would desire to do. The biggest thing I've heard, which I think has warranted uh, my attention and my curiosity, has been on the cost of the testing, about $150 uh, initially, and then now uh, cut down to $50 for Ghanaian and ECOWAS uh, citizens. I have inquired about why. I'm told that that is the uh, agreed price between the Airport Company Limited and the private service provider who was providing it. But beyond that, I mean, leader, with respect, issues of date of incorporation, etc., will not ordinarily fit in my line of work. Mr. Chairman, you an earlier answer to a question about whether the it's not very clear. The, the company that you own is in, is in your CV, yeah, where you are the managing director. Managing director, West Brown Stone Capital. Is that, a, is that the name? In an earlier answer, you said that they didn't have any liability, outstanding liability, with uh, over microfinance. No. Is that what you said? Yes. Is that for a fact? Because yes. you're under oath? Yes. Well, there's a information from Bank of Ghana that indicated that they have their, their outstanding of 212,751 212, point something. Is, is it accurate? No, I would contest that. And I would uh, believe that if this is information that um, uh, you desire to verify, I'm sure the Bank of Ghana can verify whether this is true or not. But you are also a majority shareholder in the over microfinance. Yes, that's what I referred to. My company and, was a shareholder in it. And did you borrow from Unibank? Did I do what? Did you, yes, the operations of the over microfinance. Did I borrow from over it, microfinance? Yeah. Over microfinance, borrow or took any loan from Unibank or Unisecurity? I would not have the full details on who they took a loan from. But you are 82% you are shareholder in there, right? Yes, but there are directors and managers who run the organization leader. And if you, before that company could take a loan, obviously the directors will have to be in the loan. And you are a director? No, shareholder. You are a shareholder. And you are the, the lion shareholder because 82 percent. And yes. you think that if they are going for a loan, you will not be, you will not be in the loan. Leader, in their ordinary line of business, they used to raise liabilities to create assets. They would not come back to me on every single one of those. Are, are you aware that they have defaulted in payment of their loan that they took from 
Yeah, uni, uni bank unit security. No, I'm not aware of that. Yes, Mr. Chairman, very lastly. In, uh, on uh, May, sorry, on 6 April 2020, the dirty dollar, the DW dirty dollar, they wrote to you about an assault of one Mr. Yusuf Abdul Ghani, who works for Zuria FM in Kumasi, about an assault from a military lady, and the letter was signed by Christoph Jumper, that's the head of corporate, the head of corporate communications and PR, requesting that the matter be investigated. I don't know whether, do you receive that letter from DW? I'm not sure. They wrote to me where, at the ministry or yes, the personal yes. capacity or, or where? Yeah, the, the letter This was, was a hand-delivered letter. The, the letter was dated 6 April 2020. No, about Chairman, an incident that happened on 5th of April 2020. You never received that letter? No, I do not know if there's a stamp from the ministry that says this letter was received from the ministry on that day or on any day. I don't know of this. Mr. Chairman, he said that, so far as he's concerned, Manasseh Azuri did not leave this country because he felt threatened. Is that the impression well, Chairman, that I've got I have in not said that you said? No, I have not said that. I said the information that was available to me was that he reported that his life was under threat. With the help of the National Security Minister, we provided him with a police guard. He subsequently left the country. He himself, I never heard say that he had gone into exile because his life was under threat. It was Professor Kwame Kakari who, in delivering a lecture, said so. Do I doubt him? And I went further to say that, no, I don't. But it is one of those matters that we have to get a framework that allows us, like all of the other matters I've spoken about, to validate. I have not said uh, the words that you... But you remember how you disagree with him vehemently when he did the the castle entry about the, the tax that were training yes, at I the recall. castle. Yes, I recall. And how he was taken to National Media Commission. I led the government report to the National Media Commission. And then subsequently you were seeking uh, uh, multimedia to apologize. Yes. And you thought that all those things do not fall under Article 1624 where it talks about the harassment that you said your government has complied with throughout the four years. Chairman, no. Article 166 provides for the National Media Commission, membership now of 18, following the amendment by 527, which, among other things, if you take Article 167B, says to take all appropriate measures to ensure the establishment and maintenance of the highest journalistic standards in the mass media, including the investigation, mediation, and settlement of complaints made against or by the press or other mass media. Our report of uh, multimedia and my good friend Manasseh to the National Media Commission was not out of hatred or dislike or malice. It was because we disagreed with the piece of journalism they had put together. And Chairman, if you um, observe the petition as we sent to the National Media Commission, we were profuse in even saying that we hold the station and its work in high esteem. But in this particular instance, we disagree with the work that they have done. I don't believe that reporting them to the NMC for uh, adjudication amounts to harassment. Mr. Chairman, the nominee is a lawyer, am I right? Your CV says so. That is correct. Practicing one or? No, I'm not practicing at the moment. I noticed that after the Supreme Court hearing, you are one of those who give the commentary. Right? That is correct. And also the present representative at the Minister of Information. That is correct. So while you are giving that brief, 
how are you doing that to a private citizen or in what capacity are you doing that? Oh, I think the designation is very clear in that instance that I am the lead spokesperson for the president's legal team. I think that designation has been clearly announced. So when I speak there, I speak as lead spokesperson for the president's legal team, explaining the legal positions as has been advanced in court, explaining the view of the second respondent, uh, and responding sometimes to comments that may have been made by the um, spokespersons for the petitioner's legal team. So how do, you, how do you then separate or differentiate your role in speaking for the state and speaking for candidate Akufado? So, Chairman, how we do that is that very often we try to let our address be known. So there are many instances in which during our briefs we say that this is the position of the Akufado administration. In fact, um, I think my colleagues in the media will tell you that uh, I am the one who profusely uses that expression that the Akufado administration and that there is one government of Ghana. This is the view of the government of Ghana. And then when we are speaking for the state as well, uh, we are able to make that distinction. We try very hard to make that distinction clear. Uh, very last. Uh, who is uh, Kwame Okonkuma, the chairman of Uber Microfinance? That's yeah. my father. That's, that's my father. Oh, that's your father. OK. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to ask any questions? Yes, come on. Okay. Um, so, could you, I knew about the Ghana Publishing Company some time back. And if you compare the state, the current state of the Ghana Publishing Company, there's a clear, dramatic improvement. Mm -hmm. Are you able to tell this committee what has been your role in terms of contribution to, to the current state of the Ghana Publishing Company? Chairman, so the company has a board and as a managing director. Our work at the ministry is limited to the kind of direction and facilitation we provide for the board and the managing directors and when they request it. So, for example, when they requested for um, some policy support in acquiring new equipment after board approval. We were happy so to do. And then when they came forward requesting for policy approval to uh, go into security printing, we ferried him to cabinet, got the approvals, and then ensured that the uh, same happened as well. Honorable nominee, the information service department, clearly with the passage of time, in my view, cannot remain what it is. There should be some changes in your operation and the kind of staff we even employ there. Um, what transformational efforts have you thought of or seeking to employ if you are gracious enough to be given the nod by this committee? Chairman, as I've mentioned earlier, we've already rolled out uh, the ISD transformation program which seeks to reorganize ISD into public education, RTI, research, and public relations. And we've already started work on that part. I have spoke about what we've done with the PROs, what we've done with research, and now what we seek to do with the public education um, division. Um, in the second term, the idea is to go full throttle. Nobini, I, I witnessed how you coordinated um, government response to COVID-19. Um, how effective has it been? And are there any lessons going to the future? I think one of the first lessons is that we can use our own to solve problems. You know that the president's uh, team that is put together is made up of Ghanaians uh, who are uh, showing their abilities and their excellence in various areas. Um, it is, for me, a major lesson that we don't always have to rely on the West to find solutions to um, our problems. I think another lesson is the urgency of the now in dealing with crisis situations like this, so that when um, London is burning, we don't sit and fiddle our thumbs as our leaders. Those will be two quick examples or two quick lessons that I draw from how the president has led this enterprise. The president, his wisdom, Commission the National Framework for the Prevention of Extremism and Terrorism, which I'm sure you are, you are well aware of. What 
specific steps do you envisage uh, going to the future in terms of adoption and practicalizing this framework? Well, in terms of my area, one of the things that is required is public conscientization. Because if the public is not aware of the risks of terrorism, etc., it may even be walking around in the community and they may not pick it up. Uh, extremists sliding into communities, seeking to radicalize uh, some of our population may not be picked up. So in my area, one of the big things is the uh, level of public sensitization we can bring to bear so that people can know and participate in this. Honorable Dobin, I recall, I think the seventh parliament, uh, who I served on the special budget committee, and there was a concern about monitoring of our media landscape, and that the National Media Commission was seeking to procure a particular gadget of substance to facilitate the monitoring activities. I don't know how far this has come, and if it is, it, if it is known to you what has been done about this. Yes, Chairman, the National Media Commission shared with me their costings for that project. Um, our expectation will be that as we get into a new budget cycle, we can advocate for them to be given those resources to execute this. Chairman, I'm grateful. Thank you. Chairman, I should thank you for the opportunity and also join you and colleagues in congratulating our colleagues. But just taking it from where the Honorable, with Honorable Muntaka ended, Oval Microfinance Limited, you have a legal background. You have a legal background and have studied the corporate law. Is it not the case that in many instances that companies have to borrow, it is supported by two resolutions, including shareholders' resolutions as a practice? Um. John, I think it's a direct test, rather. Uh, there may be some exigent circumstances, depending on ticket levels, that may grow up. But I think normally that's a direct test job. Yes, I say board resolution and shareholder resolution. I'm just finding out. I'm just finding out. John, my, my corporate law knowledge is that mostly it's board, board resolution, resolution. But depending if it's some extraordinary escalated matter, you are, you are a member of the Presidential Tax Force on COVID, as you indicated. Yes. The government procured a number of PPS. Is that the case? Yes. Can you just share with this committee how much it costs procuring a mask from your ministry? Just a mask. How much did you pay for it? Uh, Chairman, unfortunately, I don't have the per unit cost of a mask. Uh, as I sit here before you. It's something I can find out. You undertook procurement for procurement of PPAs. I'm aware of that. Who, me personally? No, the ministry and the presidential tax force well, and other stakeholders. Yes, but I, do, I personally do not know the cost per unit of um, a mask. Perhaps the persons who are at the forefront of the procurement exercises will know. So your ministry didn't procure mask. Chairman, my ministry procured masks. We and what cost did you procure unit, unit costs of I the can, mask? Chairman, I can fetch that and then make that available to the committee. I don't so have Chairman, the Chairman would need, would need that uh, evidence of how much it costs procuring a mask for the state so that we compare it to other uh, procurement process. That's no mask. Did you procure other PPAs other than the mask? Not to my uh, recollection. I recall that um, I think journalists and ISD staff at a point, some provision was made for them, but I don't have any further recollections. All right, thank you. In an answer to an earlier question, you were emphatic that you took over affairs of the ministry in 2019. Your handing over records says it differently. What should we rely on? I see that in a page, and I have, I have it here. Uh, handed over Ministry of Evaluation 2020, there's a paragraph, and I quote Chairman of the Indians, the ministry was under the leadership of Honorable Dr. Abdul Hamid since his rebirth in January 2017 to August 2018. He was succeeded by Honorable Kujo Pong Kuma, 
August 2018 and not 2019 as you submitted to this committee? Chairman, I think the appropriate date will be November 2018. November 2018. Uh, Chairman, I'm not challenging him. This is an official document signed by you. Yeah, Chairman, we've noticed that error, and the error comes about because the letter which is inserted into so it. So, should I assume that there are many errors in your handing over notes? No, Chairman, that Even is the only one, one that we cited. Office, we cannot have that. Yeah. No, Chairman, that's the only one that we cited. And it is because the accompanying letter, which you will find has been attached to it, was signed separately from the document um, itself. Chairman, these are not my words. I'm quoting from his own officially submitted report. And this is the record which is made available to us. What plans do you have for the Ghana News Agency? They Come still on. have uh, problems yeah. with their staff. Yeah. They have problems with office accommodation. They have challenges. You know what Reuters is doing. They can link up with many of those uh, major international links. What specific plans do you have for the Ghana News Agency? Chairman, I think the new leadership of the Ghana News Agency has developed a clear plan for turning the organization around. Their challenge has been resourcing. Um, what we are exploring with them now is how to get a number of state-owned enterprises or state-owned entities that regularly pay money to international organizations to promote their work to instead contribute that same amount of money to GNA so that GNA can use it as it were to uh, recapitalize and turn its operations around. This will include the Free Zones Board, the GIPC, uh, the Ghana Exports uh, Promotion Agency, and related agencies that usually rely on international communication platforms to promote their work. We are looking to uh, work with them to rather channel that funding through GNA so that GNA can do that same exercise for them. Uh, there are staff, just like many other staff at the Information Service Department and others, as captured in your report, suffering from the general unattractive conditions of service. Is there anything you can do about it, or generally public uh, service of Ghana? Chairman, you're talking about the Information Services Department, correct? Yes. Yeah. ISD, all yes. the entities under you, I yes. see unattractive conditions of service. So, for ISD in particular, we've managed to get them a new scheme of um, service, which uh, steps up their compensation and the environment within which they should be uh, working. For GNA, I've just spoken to uh, how we hope to get resources injected uh, therein. Um, GBC, I think I've spoken to it. Ghanaian Times is what we are working with their uh, leadership on. They have had significant changes in leadership, uh, which have made it difficult for us to get their buy-in on um, the proposals we have. As I've mentioned, Specific to the uh, state-owned media, we can recommend and suggest, but because of the creature that they are, we cannot, as it were, uh, force things on them. Chairman, I further will note that there is general lack of interest and enthusiasm in local sports, particularly football. I know you are not essentially responsible for football, but because you are, your mics are, because you are responsible for information, what is it that we can do to raise new consciousness and interest in our local sports? And what will you do as minister to enhance that? Now, if my memory is correct, in the UK at a point in time, the mandate of sports was commingled with, I think, media and culture. Because I think the view was that Media is a good tool for promoting sports. Um, I believe that a stronger collaboration between uh, the promoters of sports themselves and the managers of the media enterprises can assist in uh, bringing back the love, as it were, and showing up interest in local sports. Yeah, in an answer to the Honorable Montaka, where he referred to the Manasa Azure Exposé, and you relied on the ruling of uh, his lordship, Datiba. If you read the ruling well, there are cautions at all times as to efforts and attempts by state institutions to emasculate the media. Uh, harassment of the media may not necessarily be a direct harassment, 
But will you admit that probably those actions you considered was because of the embarrassment that was associated with the expose done by Manasa Azure, and therefore we are not wrong in assuming that subtly you were a kind of uh, seeking to punish him for what he had done. Chairman, far from that, um, I have worked at multimedia before for close to a decade. Many of the persons involved in this enterprise are persons I have personal relationships with. Indeed, during the hearings, there will be many times that the NMC officials, when they come uh, to the lobby, would joke that well, this, perhaps this is a matter you guys can go settle, because here you are sitting and chatting. It was purely on the face of our disagreement with them that the publication they had put out uh, did not meet the standards. And I think um, the, the, the ruling spoke to those specific issues. Uh, where the photographs and footage did not comply with the content and the narrative that had been put on it. But beyond that, uh, I don't think that conversations about um, embarrassment, etc., uh, will be the ones that will occasion the actions that government took. Chairman, may I require from the nominee, Ghana needs to be branded. Ghana, as a country, I've seen in your handing over notes, uh, a certain page on Brandon and as we all just drive outside here if you drive just by the uh, United Kingdom uh, embassy offices you see outside it soccer Great Britain innovation Great Britain just as we drive when you pass GIJ and you read to your left that is an act of trying to sell their country I I appreciate that it will not be an individual effort. You will need to collaborate with the Ministry of Tourism, the Ministry of Communication, and the others, even Ministry of Trade. I recall that the Honorable Hannah Tete at the time, uh, just probably that's even the day we lost President Mills, if I recall, 24th uh, July 2012. What branding plans do you have for Ghana? Chairman, branding is a very technical area. Uh, I mean, the concepts to use, the ideas to use, the examples that leader cites, uh, even if I has had a guess, themes that they have come up with after extensive research and consultation. Our general idea is to have a recognizable identity for Ghana on the global stage. That pushes trade, that pushes the exports of services, that pushes investment attractions into the Ghanaian jurisdiction. Um, in 2020, we had hoped to commence fully the Brand Ghana uh, exercise until um, almighty COVID hit us all. Um, our hope will be that as we get out of this COVID wave, now that vaccinations, etc., are in the pipeline, we can get back onto it. But the idea would be to broadly outline the themes and to find the skilled people here within the Ghanaian jurisdiction who, are, who have done a lot of these campaigns for private sector to take this and lead this, including Advertising Association of Ghana, etc., so that that identity that we are looking for, we can sell on the global stage. Do we have an advertising bill in Ghana? Advertising bill, advertising bill. No, Chairman. What so we do you see have... The, you see the streets what? unregulated District Assembly, Municipal and Metropolitan Assembly, everybody is selling something on their wall. Would you work with your collaborative ministries to give Ghana an advertising bill? So, Chairman, in an answer to an earlier question, I mentioned that I've seen the first draft, but it was withdrawn by the AAG to tidy up. And I'll be more than happy to support them and work with the minister responsible for trade so that I see the light of day. But, Chairman, on the south side, there are some of the other issues that the local authorities can also help uh, regulate, including indiscriminate uh, posting of bills, etc., or medians uh, at the local level. That can also be handled in the interim at the local level. Thank you. Have you visited any local FM station belonging to GBC outside Accra as minister? Yes, Chairman. I mentioned earlier that even for the reopening of um, the GBC station in Yendi, uh, I myself was the first person to go on air on that station, even after its um, reopening.
uh, this probably this probably may not be yours directly, but again, you are referred to the Central Digital Board, and you and your colleague, the Minister for Communication, if you check your records well, yes, we have built a digital infrastructure which was supposed to transit Ghana from analog radio to television. We expected that there will be improvement in the quality of radio and television I see that the Central Digital Board, as far as I'm concerned, is not backed by any legal framework. Will you give legality to it? As I mentioned, there are a number of residual matters, including that. I will work with the Minister responsible for communications on it. Because Chairman Wai raised it. At the time that we initiated the transition process following the Antalya Declaration, there was a committee I can recall two or three names. I can't get all the names, but I recall there was a committee where National Media Commission was represented by one Banama, uh, one Fianku representing the National Communications Authority, and one Dr. Icarus representing GBC. Therefore, the concern that the Honorable Muntaka raised, stakeholder engagement. This is a national infrastructure. Therefore, you cannot be doing this and I'm not saying you, without the input of the National Media Commission and the Independent Broadcasters uh, Association, can we be assured of that, the two of you, that uh, you may be supervising that infrastructure for the Republic? Can you give us any assurance? I have my assurance, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I can understand that uh, my colleague has been commended Ministers for information can also be ministers for disinformation. Yours is to trust in what you are saying, uh, to trust that President Akufuado, when he says $1 million per constituency, he would honor. When he is struggling with the reality checks, do you struggle with your tongue? Chairman, I'm not sure I got the question, but please come again. As a one is struggling with implementation because one million dollar will now manifest about four five point eight million Ghana cities times a year times two seventy five. Now you as Minister for Information have a difficulty selling that. I said does it make you struggle with your tongue? <laughs> Well, Chairman, as I mentioned earlier, I work with briefs as I receive them from across um, government. Uh, leader has been very experienced in this political exercise, so he will know that you rely on the briefs that you receive to do your work. Uh, where new circumstances are occasioned, uh, you must get updated briefs and seek to get the answers and be able to explain them as honestly and as clearly as possible. Uh, that is the challenge of any information minister, and it's a challenge that uh, I wake up every morning seeking to surmount. You recall the events of 14th August 2020, Papa, you remember that? Yes, sir, but I do. And you now will recall why I raise fundamental objection to your use of the language. We hold these offices in public trust. And there is a parliamentary debate, I'm holding the hands out here, on a motion of the government of Ghana seeking to monetize its mineral royalties of up to one billion U.S. dollars. Fiduciary duty. Then you sought to reduce this to a triple, one billion U.S. dollars, and your debate is about an innuendo which is shared in social media. What do you have to say to this? Chairman, as leader will recall, on that uh, fateful evening, uh, when his objection was raised, you were in the chair. Um, I voluntarily sent word to you that I would like to apologize and have it expunged from the record, and you gave me leave so to do. As leader will recall, right in the division room here, when he stepped out, I approached him and expressed again my apologies uh, uh, to him because, as I argued, I had no intention of reducing the quality of the debate. Indeed, if you follow my entire debate, I had made my submissions on the substantive matter. It was in the end that uh, my good friend George Lapro from the other side 
is the one that I uh, took a jest at. And right that day, I asked for it to be expunged from the records. No, so I'm, I'm sure. I'm, I'm not talking about jobs. We all do it on the floor of parliament. But I'm saying that the magnitude, the weight of the matter that we're debating, one billion US dollars to be mortgaged. You even argued, I'm still holding the hands up, that uh, it was not debt. But another way of debt financing, in my view, with my little finance background, I would disagree with you intellectually at that level if you say that it's not uh, debt. But whilst looking at it, I just want you to appreciate. Uh, I had uh, some Ghanaians took me on, they took you uh, on. Momentarily, you cannot, in, 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 in public service, one billion US dollars, then you are talking about who does what in social uh, media. I'm just explaining to you what my emotional offense was. Chairman, um, I hear Leader loud and clear, but he will recall that even on that day, he didn't have to explain it to me, but I went to him to express to him that I did not intend to derail the debate in any way. Right. Leader has known me for many years, even before I came to this chamber, and he knows that ordinarily, um, we would not debase a conversation of that nature. And indeed, as he mentions, the, the, the official record before him captures my submissions on the substantive uh, matter. So, Leader, you have my assurances. Minister for Information Designate, was Ghana standing in respect of COVID assets this evening? COVID, where are we? Uh, Leader, I've been here for a few hours. I may have to check the latest numbers. As as the numbers change. The last as time as I saw was about 7,000 plus. Um, but between then and now, it is possible that the numbers would have been refreshed on the website. And I may have to um, refresh my notes before I can accurately answer that question. Is a new variant in Ghana? Can you confirm or deny? Yes, Chairman. The Ghana Health Service has um, acknowledged that the new variant is in Ghana. Uh, and it has a higher rate of spread and a higher disease burden, and we're all encouraged to be more compliant of um, the preventive etiquette. Now, RTI, my interest in it is as a tool and instrument to combat corruption and to enhance greater transparency and accountability in the delivery of public services and goods. Having taken off with that legislation, what are some of your constraints as minister? Well, Chairman, not every public institution is eager to admit RTI officers as we send them or eager to designate as we require. And that is one of our challenges. We've had instances where you post RTI officers and the organizations return them uh, under the guise of we don't have room, we don't have furniture. But we've been able to successfully post a good number of them and train the numbers as I put before you. Moving forward, Chairman, we think that time is coming for us to uh, work on the legislative instrument that will flesh out some of the issues. The RTI Commission uh, has made representations to us that they would want us to discuss eventually if, um, with your grace, I do become Minister responsible for information. For example, how the Act will apply to private sector is one of the issues that under the um, regulations in accordance with um, Section 83.2 of the Act we'll have to look at. Uh, the question of um, seeding of some of the fees eventually when it comes into fruition to the RTI Commission is being discussed possibly under the LI. Prosecution of uh, offenses by the Commission is something that we are looking at. Uh, certification of public institutions that are RTI compliant by the Commission as well. So these are some of the areas that we are looking at moving forward in terms of the LI to close some of the gaps in the... So uh, you are providing leadership as minister. Uh, the frontline health services, the Honorable Muntaka referred to as assuming a Ghanaian citizen tomorrow wants to come under RTI to seek information. Can he be assured that he would have access to that information within the remit of the legislation on R RTI? and our collective quest to fight corruption. Yes, Chairman, as I mentioned earlier before your committee, already a number of people have applied under the ITI legislation and have received uh, the information that they have requested for. And we encourage anybody who wants information to visit the public institutions 
I acknowledge, however, that in these nascent days or stages, it will not be perfect from day one. But as you visit and as you draw our attention, then we can work towards tightening some of the loopholes. I'm still referring to your handing over nose, Chairman, and I refer to what the Honorable Brian Achampong had raised. And I now see practical evidence of his concern. Establishment of 140 radio studios nationwide. What do you mean by that? Chairman, you would have to give me the context. It's a big document. If it's you your document. Me. I know, but if you can just help me with the context. Okay, you want that to like to bring it no, to No, I have a copy here, so if you help me with the context. Of the GSDA 2 identified issues from performance review and profile. Chairman, which page are you referring to, sir? It has page 33 with some deep green and light green lines. If it's in context of GBC, I understand it. But if it's radio studios, I hope I'm not confusing it for radio stations. If the studio, because I'm not aware that GBC has 140 radio stations across the country. So what is this seeking to achieve? It's to, Minister of Information handing over notes, volume 2020. Just this. Yes, Chairman, are you saying page 33? Yes, page 33 of that. Summary of key development issues under the thematic areas of GS, GDA2. Yes, Chairman, I think it's a gap analysis from the GSGDA2 uh, under the theme of the transparent, responsive, and accountable governance. So, um, for example, they've identified some of the gaps which they will propose that we are able to um, close. And yes, this will be under... the summary of key issues identified from the performance review 2014 to 2017. All right, thank you. Uh, Chairman, I should be concluding. And I'll conclude relying on a quote that the Honorable Obi Amwa and my good self earlier referred to. And in your answer, you were emphatic Yes, my understanding of the Constitution, as I read it, uh, Article 162, and I always preface it with my popular observation that your right to speak ends at my right not to listen. Therefore, moral limitations, not constitutional limitations. Now, in your answer to the Honorable Mahama, moral limitations. Yes, in your answer to the Honorable Mahama Ayarga earlier on, when you started, you said constitutional censorship. That can send shivers to persons who may not understand what your real intent is. Because to the extent, yes, there are limitations. I've just given you one. But the likelihood of persons exercising state authority interfering with the work of the media and seeking to emasculate them in the name of national security is high. But what I would appreciate while you are responding to the Honorable Agaga, uh, probably this is my view, you could have used the Rwandan example. You are not obliged to think the way I think anyway. You know, when you, are, you gave me a good answer to limitations based on other people's rights and freedoms. We all know what an FM radio did to the social cohesion and the stability of uh, Rwanda. Yes, they are. But he referred to Mantambu, is that what you said? Mantambu FM in Bimbila. Now, not you. If you have Mantambu close for reasons of national security and a different FM station is operating in the same Nanumba or Bimbila, then Article 296. Are we exercising our discretion in a manner which is fair and in a manner which is candid? Uh, generally, I, 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 I would acknowledge that you are communicating well. It's just that it's difficult. You are like the Dagumba, they call them the Lunsi, those who, it's difficult. Uh, when a government has a bad economy, communication and spin cannot end it. 
So I wish you well as you prepare and uh, we'll see what we're able to do. And I can only thank Chairman for the opportunity. But to those other references that you say you will make available to us, would appreciate every other documentation. I wish you well and thank you, Chair. Yes, Honorable uh, Deputy Leader. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity. Um, Honorable Nomni, uh, graphic.com.gh, that's the online portal of graphic uh, communication, published uh, a statement by the NDC on the 19th of January 2019 in respect of the matter of uh, Ameswali. And this is what the General Secretary is quoted as having said. A statement, quote, a statement signed and issued by the party's General Secretary, Mr. Johnson, I see you doing yesterday, said, quote, this heinous crime has taken, has shaken the gun to the core and has potential to reverse the gains we have made in the promotion of press freedom. The NDC added voice to the many calls by well-meaning Ghanaians on the security agencies to ensure speedy apprehension and prosecution of the perpetrators of the cowardly acts. It goes further to quote, we decry the recent spate of violent crimes resulting in the brutal murder of five innocent Ghanaians within the last one month. According to the statement, the impunity and unchallenge with which these, those murder has been carried out pointed to an emboldening of the criminals behind them. We have also noted a public outcry and demand for the arrest of Kennedy Ejapo, MP for Assembly. Whilst taking a serious view of his call for the assault of the late journalist and agreeing in principle with his questioning for possible involvement in this crime, we caution against the mere scapegoating of Mr. Japan as a ruse to cover up a potentially more sinister plot behind this killing, the statement said. Now, what is your reaction to the position by Honorable John Sinesi Katia that Mr. Kennedy Japan should not be a scapegoat in that matter, but that the state security agencies should look at it broadly as a heinous crime and investigate him accordingly. Chairman, um, as I mentioned earlier, to the extent that some uh, conclusiveness has not been brought to this matter, the matter will be at large. And in uh, what the Deputy Leader has read to me, it appears that the General Secretary of the NDC is suggesting that a particular angle of that conversation, which is the Canadian Japan angle, um, may hold no bearing on the substantive matter, and that it may just be something that, if you follow, will deny you the opportunity to find the real uh, culprit. But this is exactly the point I was making earlier. But then you have different people have been different views um, on it. And that is why it's important that the state has a mechanism for doing so. Because if the General Secretary of the NDC is of the view that Mr. Kennedy Japan is not involved and that following him will cause you to miss the real matter, and other people hold other views, unless you do that proper investigation and get to the bottom, we will be speculating. Chair, in an earlier question by Mr. Ablakwa, he stated, quote, that you had indicted the NDC government in your statement for having failed in its regulatory supervision of our financial sector, leading to the subsequent meltdown. Now, this position of indictment, as he 
coded you are to have taken uh, was actually a position taken by President John Dramani Mahama when he addressed us on the State of the Nation um, 2016 that Bank of Ghana officials failed in his supervision of the financial sector. So I want you to clarify. Were you basing your 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 statement on that indictment by the former president of his own administration and for that matter the Bank of Ghana or this is a position that you are taking to indict his government? No, Chairman, as I think I've mentioned even earlier, I don't even speak for myself per se. I speak for the government or the administration or the state. And in um, my answer to his question, I mentioned that there are a number of reasons that have been explained in times past. Now, Honorable Nominee, I ask this question with a lot of passion. And this is the third time I'm asking this to a nominee. You know, government has placed restrictions on some drugs, importation of certain drugs and giving the space to Ghanaian pharmaceutical companies to manufacture. Yet, labels and packaging are still imported from India and China. We know you've talked about assembly press. You've talked about graphic communication and some other media outlets. Graphic communications has capacity. Assembly press has capacity. Most of our media, uh, print media houses, depend on um, companies that have printing capacity to feed us with news. The minister, the minister designate for health, assured this committee that he will take steps to ensure that the pharmaceuticals at least give opportunity to our local printing press. That area comes under your domain directly. Can you assure us that you will proactively work with him to ensure that our local uh, printing press get that opportunity? You have my assurances, Chairman. Now, um, Honorable Harun Idrisu has indicated that it is very difficult to be a government communicator, and no doubt it is. We heard the hue and cry about people losing their investment. How did you see the reactions of Ghanaians to the relief of $22 billion that government injected by way of paying people who had lost their investment. How did the narrative change? It, uh, everything that government does is subject to feedback and different perceptions. And so you cannot take it for granted that because you believe you are doing something good, that will be the end of the matter. For us, uh, what is important that is that we consistently inform and educate and respond to queries and questions that will come up. So we don't get worried about how the public sees A or B or C or X or Y or Z. Our focus is to ensure that we do education. That's it. But were Ghanaians happy when eventually that relief came from your feedback you had? And I'm saying to you that you can't take it for granted. So what you have to do is to consistently educate and inform the public with the expectation that in the end, the majority of the people will understand the message that you are putting across. I'll give you an example. Very well. Uh, so finally, be... finally, COVID relief. NBSSI is on record to have disbursed 500 million cities directly through Momo. Uh, Chairman, uh, this is not the first time the deputy leader the last time you could have 528. Why is it 500 today? Did I use it correctly? You said 500. We follow have, you. The, uh, honorable leader, I have the exact figure here. 502 million 
500,000 to 288,000 beneficiaries. I have it here. It's on their website. And I have it here. You can check MBSSI website. These monies went directly, not through any political channel. The ordinary trader who benefited, was there any means that your outfit used in measuring their joy upon receipt of these reliefs directly for their businesses? Because 500 million cities, you don't, by going online to fill the form and getting the alert without having to go through anybody was really unprecedented. Was there a mechanism of measuring how good this news was to the ordinary trader at Mokola? Well, Chairman, the research exercises we conduct, um, in all honesty, have not set out to uh, get answers to that question. I'll take that as a cue that perhaps moving forward, we should get some empirical answers to that. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. I don't have no more. We, 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 we said we would try and do three hours. This is four and a half hours. That's how disciplined we are with our time management. We'll try. But we thank you for attending upon the house and for enduring us. Thank you, Chairman. And this charge. Thank you, Chairman.
your battle suit. There's so much fire! This guy is hitting me. Had to be struck from an asteroid when it pulled him out of his ocean depth. your battle suit. There's so much fire! This guy is hitting me. Had to be struck from an asteroid when it pulled him out of his ocean depth. 